gamers. You're listening to the Short Pause Gaming Podcast. This is episode number 124. And welcome back to another edition of the Short Pause Gaming Podcast. I'm Brent Felsing, and as always, I'm joined by Frankie Ayler, Ben Boyce, and Bender Holt. Gentlemen, it's good to be back. How are you guys doing this evening? Not bad. Not bad. Good. Not as good yeah. as you, Brent. Oh, yeah, not as good as me, that's for <laughs> sure. Another another year closer to 40. Yay. Yay me. How you, what, what have you guys been up to this week, man? Frankie, that beard is looking just epic. Absolutely yes. epic, man! You're doing a great job. I talked before the show. You need to start putting conditioner in that thing, dude. Yeah, I, I do sometimes. Yeah, but probably it's getting to the point where you gotta start doing it a little more frequently. Yeah, so. T- put a little conditioner and run a fine, you know, fine tooth comb <laughs> through it and make it nice and neat, oh, yeah. dude. Yeah, there you go. I, I heard do the comb thing, you know, because it's to that point now. Yeah, so. yeah. Man, no, how- it's cool. It's got like this dual swirl thing going on at the bottom <laughs> of it. So, uh, now how old is that beard? Um, so, so, what was that? February. Holy cow! Is that the so February? Since February. One? Wow. Yeah. So this is since then. What is the the longest you've gone? Like seriously, are uh, we are we approaching any records? Because that looks like actually, a record. Yeah, period. this one this one is typically I go about five months. So well, we're about there. Wow. You gonna uh, dude? Keep it through. Keep it throughout the rest of the year. At least till Destiny Two. Keep it out till Destiny Two. That's doable. Oh my god, he's gonna look like ZZ Top, dude. That's gonna be fantastic. <laughs> really hope. That's that's the end goal. That's the end goal. <laughs> that's the end game. I like it. Boys, what's going on with you, man? Not much, dude. Just uh, another another week in paradise, <laughs> and uh, yeah, not not much, man. Just getting by. I feel you. And Mr. Holt, how are you this evening, sir? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Just uh, yeah. Can't complain. <laughs> I guess not. Awesome. <laughs> well, uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, we're, we're not even going to go to the new releases first. Nope, nope, nope. Something much bigger happened this week, and that is the Destiny 2 beta. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty happy with what we played. Obviously, there are some some things that we would like to see tweaked prior to launch. But uh, boys, I want to start with you. Let's kind of let's kind of get this Destiny uh, Two beta impression segment going, dude. Let's get it going. Um, yeah, I've I've had a good time with the beta. <clears throat> played uh, been playing it throughout the week. Played it a lot more today. Um, went back to the strike again. Really, really, really dig the opening mission. I think it's a great way to start the game. I think it's it's clear that if if the rest of the game is is structured or follows a similar path to the way that opening mission does then the story in this game is going to be a, a marked improvement and even more so it's going to it's going to be awesome mm-hmm. um so really really like the opening mission had a had a ton of fun playing through that a few different times um the the strike mission i thought was a lot of fun it's you know the stuff we've come to expect from strikes there was even a few kind of uh um sections in that that were you know a little bit different than what you'd see in a typical strike like navigating the drill section and um you know, kind of the the tiered stages to the boss. I thought were were really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and then the crucible. The crucible also was was a good time. It's uh, it's different. It's it's actually in in some ways it's a lot different than Destiny One in terms of in terms of the way it plays. I've spent a lot of time in the crucible on Destiny One, um, so it's gonna take some getting used to with, with Destiny Two. But I played a lot of the crucible today. Just kind of wrapping my head around it a little bit more, and um, you know, I, I like what I've played so far. It's fast paced, it's fun. The the smaller team engagements are are a much more intimate setting, and it keeps the action moving really, really fast paced. So uh, yeah, overall, man, I, I've I've enjoyed my time with Destiny Two, and I can't wait to see where we go from here. Mm-hmm. Bender, uh, initial impressions of the beta. Um, well, I. I thought the beta was really good. Um, as a returning Destiny player, I thought the beta was awesome. Uh, I I really enjoyed the homecoming mission. I played it three times with all three subclasses or classes. Um, 
The inverted spire strike is awesome. Did played, you know, we played some crucible. It was really cool. I like the changes of the crucible. I like the countdown mode. It's all pretty fun. However, I do have kind of a hot take on the Destiny 2 beta. Uh -oh. Now, even though I loved my experience with it, I feel like the Destiny... We all know that, the, that these betas are, in, are in, in addition to working out server issues and things like that, we all know that these betas are really kind of more for marketing, for like a demo for people to play, to, 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 to want to buy the game. I feel like the Destiny 2 beta is not a good demo for people if they want new players to come into to Destiny with this installment. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think it did its its job to bring in new players. I think they really catered it towards people who are uh, returning players like us, and I think that was a missed opportunity. And the reason I say that is because like I'm I'm going back to, to my memories of my experience with the Destiny One beta. Mm -hmm. When I jumped into Destiny 1, with that beta, I downloaded it onto my PS3 because I didn't even have a PS4 yet. And I knew nothing about Bungie, never played a Halo game. I didn't really know anything about Destiny. I didn't know exactly what it was. I had just heard a lot about it, so I wanted to check it out. And I enjoyed the gameplay, and the story seemed interesting at first, but what really hooked me in the Destiny 1 beta was the sense of progression. As you play through these levels, you're, you're, you're progressing, you're, you're leveling up your character, mm -hmm. you're ranking up your guns and your armor, and that's what really hooked me. And that was completely absent from the Destiny 2 beta. So I feel like that was a missed opportunity. I mean, you did not get to rank, rank up your character at all. There's no ranking up of the weapons. Sure, mm -hmm. you get a few new weapons in the Crucible, so there is a little bit of something to, to look forward to there. But what really grabbed me for the Destiny 1 beta is that promise of like new powers and new abilities and another subclass down the line and all that stuff. So I, I feel like they should have had some, maybe a couple more mis story missions and l allow us to level up a little bit because mm -hmm. that's what's going to dr draw in new players and, and get them hooked onto the game. Because <clears throat> the, uh, the Homecoming mission, as awesome as it was, People who have never played Destiny One have no idea what anything is. They don't. They don't know what the Traveler is. They don't know who mm -hmm. the Cabal are. It's. It's just. Um, you know, they have no frame of reference. So I mean, that's just. That's just kind of something I thought of as I was playing through that. It's like I. I really don't think this beta would have grabbed any new players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you're right. I do think this this beta was geared towards more veterans of the franchise, guys who have played a lot of Destiny 1. And I can understand why they would do that because a lot of those people are the ones that, that wanted more story, a better story, a better approach to the cutscenes and whatnot. And, th and, and they definitely delivered on that front. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was telling my buddy, he was like, hey, I'm downloading the beta. He didn't play Destiny 1. And as he was downloading, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, yeah, don't forget, you know, you're going to have different abilities. You're going to have your supers that you can call up at certain times. Like, I don't think he knows any of that stuff about this game. Like, he literally knows. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in this beta. And again, this is a beta. This isn't a demo. I mean, a demo would probably be more ideal to show off, you know, hey, look, here's what this game's going to be and da 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 But at the same time, Bungie's trying to win over an audience that kind of wrote the game off before they even spent any significant time with it the first time around. And I think this was, even though a beta, I think it was an opportunity, especially since it was an open beta, to kind of, like you said, kind of get their grips in, in some of the, the people who are on the fence or maybe just brand new to the franchise. Uh, there's not a whole lot in there to tell you. Here's how you use your super. Here's, you know, here's when to use it. Here's how often you use it. Here are the things you have to do to get it. There's not a whole lot of that explanation here. But again, that's simply because this this beta was geared towards uh, uh, veterans of the series. So I can understand where you're coming from there. But at the same time, it's, you know, this is a beta. It's not exactly a demo. Uh, and anybody that knows anything about Destiny knows how to play the game. And there's a lot of people that know how to play this game. But I do understand what you're saying. This wasn't the most mm -hmm. accessible for newcomers. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the love the beta. I thought that it was really fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, it's, I, I thought it was good, and I can't wait to play the full game when it comes out. I really would have loved to have seen a taste of the open world mm -hmm. and seeing how that the patrols work and all that stuff. So I guess we'll have to wait till September 6th, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to checking all that stuff out too. Mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, uh, real quick, Brent. Um, actually, uh, I... I, I see what you're saying, Benner, and I actually felt that as a as a returning player personally. Um, obviously, the reason I played Destiny is to, you know, move your character up the ranks and that kind of stuff. So in in that respect, 
it didn't it didn't quite feel like what the game is going to feel like just yet you know you're, mm -hmm. you're missing you're missing that sense of uh, moving from point a to point b and uh mm -hmm. you know we were able to get some loot and get some different drops and that was cool but like you said the progression wasn't there and I, th I think there's there's a couple things that go into that one i i really think that they are trying to save a lot of what this game is for when we actually play it at launch I'm still not convinced that everything we saw from just the stuff that we saw was even the way that the game's going to be played out once all is said and done. Like, I don't know if the if the subclasses that we saw, if we saw everything that's going to go into them, like if all the nodes around there, there could be new ones when the game is actually revealed. Uh, yeah. There could be extra features on some of these guns that we had. There, there, you know, there could be any any number of, of different things that, that could be in the game. The first mission is not going to play out exactly like we just played through it. You know, we're not going to mm -hmm. be playing that mission as a level 20 character and be playing that as somebody who just hops into the game. So who knows what guns we're going to have access to? Who knows if we're even going to get that exotic that we get during that mission? So there's there's a lot of things that are going to play out differently. And I feel like Destiny 1 was such a huge game and it, it reached a lot of people and even the people that didn't play the game. Like everybody knows Destiny, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody that's a video game player has heard of Destiny and knows of Destiny. And the one thing that anybody... Who, uh, who either played Destiny or didn't has heard about this game is is issues with the narrative. Like even if you never stepped a, a foot in the Destiny or played it for a single second, you've probably heard somebody talking about the narrative or the story in this game and probably bitching about it. So um, I think they uh, it behooved them and and they really wanted to get that out here. Like, look, we're tackling our story very differently than we did the first time around. Like, we're really trying to focus and hone in on what's going on here. And playing through that first mission, like, the way it's structured and the way it plays out is really cool. And even if even if you're somebody who doesn't know those characters and doesn't know what's going on, I think there's enough there to, like, get you really interested in what's going on. Like, when you meet Gaul for the first time and you meet these characters who are, are clearly, like, have, have been through a lot and they're emotionally tied to this this place that's getting destroyed by the cabal so i think there's enough there to kind of bring people in and make people th think like man you know i i heard a lot about the story in destiny one i've heard they're going to try to do stuff different in destiny two and you know i hopped in i played this first mission it was awesome i don't really understand a lot of what's going on but there's a lot of cool stuff in here and i really like this guy that shows up at the end and i want to see where this goes from here and then you hop in and you experience a little bit of the crucible and you see this fast-paced pvp experience which you know, a lot of people buy shooters to play PvP, so they get in and they, and they play that for the first time and see that that's a lot of fun. And then they, they hop into the, the strike and they get a little bit of a taste of one of these longer, more prolonged missions that, that involve multiple people. So, um, you know, I, I think they they were they were kind of faced with the dilemma here, kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't, in terms of Bungie. Like, they had a certain way that they had to go with the beta. They could have They could have done a more, like... A more destiny one type of take on the beta but at this point everybody pretty much knows what destiny is even if they haven't played it so i think they they thought the the better way to go was to do it the way they did it here give us a taste of this story and kind of save all that all that sense of of exploration that sense of adventure that sense of like when you first get into the game like all that kind of stuff save that for when you first get the game and uh you know in, in the end um you know, we'll, we'll see how it all plays out, but I'm I'm uh, I'm okay with the with the route they chose to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, yeah, I I, um, I sent out a tweet, uh, and uh, I, I asked, you know, if anyone who ha out there who has who never played Destiny One and who played Destiny Two, the the beta, and and what their thoughts were. I only got two replies, and they were on the opposite end of the spectrum. <clears throat> One guy was like, "Well, I never played Destiny One. I love the Destiny Two beta. I'm planning on picking it up when it when it launches." Another guy was like, "I didn't like it." Um, I felt like it was confusing. I didn't know what was going on, and I don't plan on picking it up when it when it launches. So, I mean, obviously, there's going to be some people who really who really clicked with the beta and, and plan on getting it, even if they never played Destiny before, and some who don't. So, I mean, it, at, at the minimum, they're going to have the same community they had they had in Destiny One, and they might pick and pick up a few new people or or a few returning people who who fell off. So. I mean, uh, I don't know. Either way, I guess it's a good thing, but uh, I just felt like they could have done more to draw in new people. Mm -hmm. 
And see, that's that's the thing when we come, when we talk about these betas. We, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen these betas kind of blur with demos. You know, people are drawing uh, drawing conclusions. They're 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 taking what they see from the beta, and they're like, okay, this really isn't my type of game. So therefore, it is acting sort of as a demo. But from a beta perspective, this is one thing I want to talk about um, for really quick here. Is from a beta perspective, this game runs great. I mean, in terms of like the servers. And being able to jump into matches, I mean, literally, other than when we first logged in, when I first logged in on day one, when they had that termite error that popped up and people trying to sign in, as soon as they turned the servers on, I didn't run into one single issue the rest of the week. Dude, I mean, we were seriously in and out of multiplayer games. Boom, boom, boom. The strike mission loaded up right away. I mean, everything from a beta perspective, this game ran fantastic. And you know that mm-hmm. that's separating it from the demo perspective. I mean, I liked what I played. This is more of Destiny with with, with better cutscenes and and a better uh, a more interesting story to start things off. Uh, the PvP, uh, I got wrecked a lot, as which is to be expected mm-hmm. with Destiny. But like I said, from a beta perspective, that was the most impressive thing. There were a lot of people trying to get on uh, on day one of early access on both PlayStation Four and Xbox One, and those servers held up strong. I mean, very, very strong. And they've gone strong all weekend. Now, I haven't been on 24-7. I've seen some people post on Twitter. I see pictures pop up. You know, hey, look, I'm bumping into this new error. But for the most part, from my experience, and Ben, I know you've probably played a lot more. Bender, you probably have as well. I mean, has it been a smooth ride the whole time through for you guys? Yep. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Outside uh, outside of, like, yeah, like you said, like that first hour, Really, mm-hmm. it, it, and that's really about all it was. It was about an hour at the beginning of the beta when they were kind of getting some stuff worked out, and since then, yeah, it's just been smooth sailing. Man, that's fantastic. That's really, 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 really good. Mm-hmm. Um, now let's uh, break. We'll jump into a couple aspects of the beta real quick. We'll talk. We'll start with the story mission first. Obviously, this is the mission that we saw when they when they broke out the gameplay reveal for the first time. It's the opening mission, Homecoming. You're in the tower. It's decimated. It's been blown to pieces. The Red Legion are everywhere. Uh, talk about that real quick, boys. Just give me your your, your quick thoughts on the presentation of Homecoming and your uh, first uh, true introduction to Gaul. I uh, loved it, dude. The, you know, we the the mission that we saw played out on the uh, on the live stream reveal. It's actually there. There's a little bit more to it than what they showed us there. So, there's really a whole half of that mission that we hadn't seen prior to that. So I thought it was cool to get in there and experience the full mission from start to finish. I uh, thought it was was set up really cool. There's some really like uh, rah rah exciting moments in there as you're going through. Um, as a player who's played a lot of Destiny 1, you know, going through and, and seeing your old haunts like flaming and torn to pieces and seeing the characters that you fought alongside for the last three years, like seeing them, you know, uh, backs against the wall, kind of fighting for survival is, is really neat. And then, um, yeah, and then Dominus Gaul, his appearance at the end is just just awesome i mean this guy mm-hmm. seems this guy seems like he's just gonna be one hell of a badass i can't wait to see his story can't wait to confront him probably at the end of the campaign and then and then further in the raid from there so uh yeah i'm really looking forward to see where they where they go with the story but i thought the the first mission was a really really good epic way to start the game and uh, it kind of gets things going with the bang and that's really uh that's really all I could ask for in terms of like a, a start to Destiny is like let's start like right in the action to get some some like high octane stuff going and get this, get this thing moving and I thought they accomplished it here. Bender, yeah, I thought it was great. <clears throat> I, like I said, I played through with all three uh, classes and um, really really cool. I like that uh, you you know you see some of the characters you've seen and uh, you know throughout your hundreds of hours in destiny um you run into shacks and he's like he opens up the armory and you get your first exotic weapon and it's a different weapon depending on which class you're playing i thought that was really interesting um and you know you're fighting through the hangar and all you know where, where all the ships are i mean you go through the the, the plaza of the tower you, you run into to um Zavala there and he's you know he's you're fighting off the, the red legion wave after wave of them one thing that was really cool is um or i thought it was really interesting the third time i played through it 
uh, which, well, first of all, I don't know if you guys know this, but every once in a while, other guardians will spawn in yes. and fight with you uh, mm-hmm. in that plaza area, which I thought was in. It doesn't happen every time, but I, that, it, that happens every once in a while, which was cool. But one thing that happened the third time I played through it is you know how you know Zavala is like, oh, h- h- incoming, get in my shield, and he like pulls up his shield, and all these bombs come out. If you if you step outside of that shield while those bombs are falling, you you die. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, at one point the he I was in his shield, and for some reason the shield dropped a little bit early, and I got hit by the bombs, and I almost <laughs> died. My my health was flashing, and then I, was, I looked around, and I was like, where'd Zavala go? And there was a ghost floating there. Zavala died, and I had to revive him. His, his, I walked up to his ghost and said, interact, and it said square, and I held square, and I revived Zavala. And then he said his next line of dialogue after he, after he was alive again. I just like, I was like, I didn't know he could die. That's pretty funny. <laughs> nice. Yeah, but um, just going through that, that homecoming mission several times, I mean, it was super cool. Um, you know, seeing Gaul for the first time, he's very intimidating. I, I think he's going to be a really cool villain. Mm-hmm. Um you know, seeing yourself lose the light and your ghost falls to the ground and and everything, I, it made me want to see what happens next. I, I can't wait to see how it, where where the story goes from there. Um, but yeah, it it was it was really really cool. I loved it. Awesome. Uh, now, Frankie, you, you didn't hop into the beta. You had some, you had a bunch of stuff going on this week, and uh, and I, I, I know you had some questions about um, a couple of things of the beta. What what, what one did you want to start off with? Um. So I guess like is like the new the new way that the weapons are all distributed. You know, you kind of don't have like that. Uh, you know, like you can have multiple shotgun sniper rifles. Did you guys get to? Is that system like in there? Like, is it enough to like make a difference or anything? Uh, boys, you want to start this one off? Yeah, it uh, it it the weapon system is alive and well, Franklin, and it, it makes a huge difference. The gameplay is significantly different with this new weapon system set up in both PvP and, and PvE settings. And um, this is this is actually one of the concerns I have with the game right now. I'm not I'm not 100% convinced that this is the right way to go, at least for the PvE experience. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, first of all, because you you're using the same weapons in your first two slots, and a, a lot of them are are similar deal or deal with similar um results so to speak so like your your auto rifles your pulse rifles like your hand cannons like those all kind of operate at a similar range and can can deal with enemies in in a similar way and you have scout rifles in there as well so you can get 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 a little more of a range going with them um you have submachine guns which are, are really like up close but a lot of them you know fire similarly a lot of them are fully automatic even the even the pulse rifles and the automatic rifles so outside of the elemental damage that's on the on the secondary weapons there's not much of a difference between using those first two slots and one of the big issues they have in the beta right now is that power ammo is extremely scarce mm-hmm. not only in PVP but in PvE as well i went through the entire inverted spire strike today and i got power ammo once one drop the entire time so when you have your shotguns and your fusion rifles and your your sniper rifles and your grenade launchers and your rocket launchers and all these like these really super powerful weapons that are fun to use and that kind of differentiate themselves from the main weapons and you don't get to use them a lot that that's disappointing. Mm-hmm. So um, this is this is something that that Bungie's aware of and, and you know we'll, we'll talk about some of the stuff they've been talking about here in a second. But they're aware of these issues, so I expect this to change moving forward. Um, you know, this, this change made a lot of sense for the PvP so that, you know, so things like shotguns and sniper rifles wouldn't run amok in that space and, and make a more balanced experience overall for that. So I, I understand why they why they went this route, but I'm not 100% convinced right now in the current state that it is. And granted, this is just a beta. This is not indicative of what the final game is going to be necessarily. So, but in this current state, I'm not 100% convinced that this is the right way to go with this. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see if that changes moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same boat. It was really strange at, at times playing through the, the, the opening mission and I'm switching back between my primary and my secondary and they're both assault rifles and one does elemental damage. You're kind of, kind of like, well, you know, I kind of wish that's where I always enjoy being able to switch to a shotgun for close quarter combat, you know, for close quarter combat. Now you have your hand gun, your hand cannons and your submachine guns. And you know, you know, you use your scout rifles and your assault rifles for a little bit more range. It's just, it is very, it is kind of strange 
jumping back between assault rifles, and then you have to go in and change up. Like, yeah, to see the fusion rifles, the shotguns in the power section is still kind of jarring for me because I always enjoyed having the, the fusion rifle as my, my secondary and, 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 and the shotguns as my secondary with the elemental damage. So that is kind of different. It, it, it takes a little bit getting used to it. I'm not really sure how I feel about it just yet. But um, no, it does stand out. It does feel a lot different uh, when you're when you're when you're going back and forth between your weapons, and especially when you have like two assault rifles or if you have two hand cannons, it is kind of strange at first. Mm. Now, do uh, so like the two that you're switching between? Do they share an ammo pool, or are they Mm-mm. okay? No, yeah, they, they still have their own ammo. Yeah, because like the 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 kinetic energy is still the white ammo boxes, and then your mm-hmm. your um the energy weapons are green now. And then obviously, like fusion rifle, shotguns are the purple. Cool, cool. Um, so, like, as far as like the strike goes, do you guys think that they like? How does the strike structure feel like for the this obviously newer strike? Um, you know, like a lot of the other other strikes. I don't want to say that they're similar, but they're kind of um, pretty linear. It's, it's not like hard to get lost. You know, you can. It's pretty hard to get lost. But uh, like, how is this one? Is this any different? Like, is this more? Is it more puzzly? Are they still kind of the same? strike format um i would say i mean it felt like a it felt like a destiny strike but uh it was interesting at first because when you first start the strike it's obviously like you know you can go here but the map is huge i mean it's i mean we we, after we beat the strike once we were just like okay let's go back in here again and just wander about the map and we wandered around for a while and there was a lot to explore so at the beginning, there's a lot going on in there. You can go around. There's Fallen fighting over here, and there's Vex fighting over here, and there's you know there's a lot of way, but it still has your you know objective here. Go here, and then go here, and go here, and there are layers to it. You know, there's but what was cool about the strike mission, especially this one, was was that you know we saw in the trailer those huge cranes that were like kind of going around this this cavern that you were making your way through. So there was some like environmental. Uh, uh, um, hazards that you had to work your way, work your way around. You know, if you got hit by one of these drills that was going around, it would kill you. So that added a whole new element to it. You had to make your way through this area, and there's different tiers of cra- uh, of drills. You know, there's one you know ahead of the other one. There's like three different levels, so you have to bounce around and be careful. So I guess you could call that kind of like a puzzly element uh, because you have to make your way through this valley to get to the next uh, to the next area. So I thought that was really really cool to kind of have like an environmental hazard. To, uh, to have to play around as you're battling all the enemies on the screen. I would uh, I would also say that that the boss is a little bit different than what we've come to expect from the strikes. Mm-hmm. So th- this guy had a few different stages that he went through. So it wasn't like, you know, mo- most strikes you have an enemy and they just kind of, they sit there, they have their cronies that come around and you, you battle them and then basically he's just like a, a bullet sponge and you just got to shoot him enough times for him to die. This boss was a little bit different. There was different stages, different tactics, different kind of tears that that you battle this this boss across so i thought that was cool mm-hmm. also there there's a few areas in the strike that are really open so like you go into that area before you get to the dig site mm-hmm. it's just this huge open field with enemies on multiple multiple areas and you can kind of go whichever way you want so um you know the best thing to do is maybe just to split the team up send one guy up the middle one guy to the left and one guy to the right and kind of span the map and see what's around there but there, there's like these big, huge open sections with enemies all over the place. You can kind of, you know, explore around and tackle that as you see fit too. So that, that I think was was a little bit of a different take as well. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, it was almost like kind of like a big funnel effect. Like it started off super open, all these areas to explore, and then as you kind of, it just kind of funneled in towards the final battle. Like it kind of got tighter, a little more linear. But it was open at first, big time. Cool. Uh, then the only thing I'm curious about is. Uh, before we were talking about, you know, um, like with your your uh, supers, like you could have the bubble and also the shield. Like, did you guys get to play around with that and figure out what exactly you can do with your supers? Like with the bubble and the yeah, shield? The, or... With the Sentinel in particular, I mean, you, you press L1 and R1 to use the shield and you just kind of run around, hit stuff. You can throw it one time. I, as far as I could tell, you can only throw it one time yeah. during the, the super use but then you, for the rest of the time, you just have to like ram into people. Then you hold L1 and L2 to use the bubble instead. So you, uh, so it's one or the other, um, but you have that option with that particular uh, thing. I didn't notice any other, um, any other like optional supers from in, in the, in any other subclasses or anything. Um, but I'm still holding out hope that self res is going to be a thing in the final game, but they <laughs> did, I didn't, I didn't see any indication of it in the beta though. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's one of the things. Uh, sorry, real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's one of the things, Frankie, that makes the Titan uh, Sentinel really unique is the amount of options that he has as a character. So, you know, whether you want to use the bubble or, or throw the throw the shield out there, you know, you you have different options for different situations. So that that makes that character really cool. And like Bender was saying, you can throw the shield once, um, but it, it it'll basically hit every enemy that's in front of you. So if I were to throw the shield into a group of enemies, it's gonna bounce off of all of them and like kill them all before it returns back to me. And then you can you can proceed to like ram people from there and 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 do what you have to do with it. So it's it's a it's actually a really cool class. I got to play around with it a little bit. Nice. You know, speaking of the classes and their abilities, man. I- I hate to say this, but the hunter is the most worthless one. <laughs> um, I mean, Arc Strider is fun. I actually started getting the hang of that the more I played. I enjoyed the Arc Strider ability, but in this in Destiny Two, your character has an ability tied to the circle button. So, like um, the a warlock, if he held down circle, he'd pop this like this little area where people can jump into, where you could change it between either um, it was healing, it would yeah, heal you, healing or it, or w- weapon, weapon buff. buff. So you could yeah. do a weapon buff. So it was a kind of like a team thing. You know, if everyone was there, you pop it real quick. Everyone jump in there. You get a weapon buff. You shoot from within that circle, and you do more damage. Boys popped it a couple times in PvP, and we wrecked it pretty good. So it was nice to have that. And then with the with the um, the Titan, if you hold circle or if he tap circle, he'll throw. Is it, if he tap, he does the full wall. No, you, you can. It's a, it's a, you can switch between them. Uh, mm-hmm. Just like with the warlock, you can switch between okay. it. So you, you're holding circle to activate it, but you can switch between either a full wall, like like body length that you can stand behind to block enemy fire, or a half wall that you can crouch behind and mm-hmm. then uh, you can peek out and shoot. And then when you when you go back down, it's an instant reload. So you can pe- keep peeking out and going back down and peeking out and mm-hmm. shooting uh, un- behind this wall. So that that was the uh, inherent skill for all the. It, that's for every across all the Titan subclasses. You can use that. So you got these two awesome little abilities that the <laughs> Titans and the Warlocks have, and then you go to the Hunter, and you can tap circle to dodge, do a dodge <laughs> roll. Yeah, it's basically shade step that the nice that the uh, what are they called? Nice stalkers. Night stalkers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's basically that shade step move. And you can <laughs> choose between either, re- like, once you do it, you reload automatically when you do it, or there's some other. I mean, it's seriously it's seriously the most worthless of the abilities. <laughs> it, but a team it, player. It can be useful, though, because that other ability that he has is the is the instant recharge on the melee. Yeah. So if you, if you melee, like, do the dodge step, you could theoretically, like, keep chaining your melees together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that move in the right hands, it's more of like an advanced tactic, I think, when all is said and done. Like somebody's going to have to really get in there and learn how to use it. But mm-hmm. I think the people that learn how to master it are going to be dangerous mm-hmm. when they uh, when they get their heads around exactly how that works. It really does set the hunter off as a lone wolf type of character, though. I mean, you don't get any – it doesn't benefit the team. I mean, it does <laughs> if you clear out a whole room of enemies, like you said, if you master it and you wipe everyone out. But that was the most – for me, that was disappointing because I, I do like playing as a team player. I like doing helping people out, whether it's healing people or, or, or adding a damage buff. So the hunter is, in my opinion, the least impressive out of all uh, out of all the characters, which I hate to say, because warlocks are terrible and titans are just awful people, <laughs> so uh, it's just uh, that that was kind of a bummer. But overall, though, I thought it was really cool. Some of the classes and, and the class subclasses, Arc Strider was fun, Sentinel was fun, Dawn Blade was a blast to, to whip on people. So I mean, the, the, their abilities are there. I just didn't like that. That like that. What is that called? Like I know there's a super. Is that special ability? I, uh, I don't know what we call them now. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot what they called it. Yeah, I'm not even sure what it's called, but yeah, the hunter was the, was the most disappointing of it. Oh, and also Frankie, um, I was looking at some of the like nodes for the uh, warlock subclass. Um, first of all, the well, the warlock has an air dodge now, so if you're if you're if you're mm-hmm. gliding, you can pr- tap circle and you'll dodge, which nice. is really cool. Um, one of the nodes that you can select later on, which I it wasn't available in the beta, but I was looking at it, is, is you can while gliding you can sh- you can aim and shoot and also throw grenades. So Ooh. like as it is now, if you gl- if you if you aim while you're in there, you just drop down to the ground. But warlocks will be able to aim and shoot while gliding and th- also throw grenades, which is going to be super some make for some super cool aerial combat. <laughs> <laughs> warlocks making it rain. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. 
the void walker has blink as well so you can imagine the void walkers blinking around the map and gliding through the air and just confusing the hell out of everybody <laughs> about what exactly is going on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how's the new nova bomb look uh it's really interesting i i think it's i think you can switch between the regular nova bomb or the big like slow moving one if you choose the slow moving one it'll track and then it when it when it hits it'll de detonate into smaller pieces that'll also track which is interesting and you can shoot it to make it de detonate early mm. so yeah it's it's very very cool <laughs> sweet the hunter gets si like six shots with his golden gun it's pretty that's sweet that's like twice as many as before yeah it's awesome because he goes yeah, like six... he goes like this oh yeah, yeah six... last six shots is a lot yeah, Last the Striker Titan now. can can use his fist of havoc more than once. He can use it and then get, get run off and use it again, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, the fist um, of havoc was wreaking havoc in PvP. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good was. lord. <laughs> <laughs> I I loved it being in control though and being able to like uh you know capture a control point and then drop the warlock uh, buff mm -hmm. circle. And then stand in there with the with the weapon buff and just mow down people as they were trying to come into the control point. Like mm -hmm. That was that was that was awesome. Dude, that was a go to move for a couple rounds before Bender hopped yeah. on. That's all you were doing. You kept we'd capture a point, you'd pop that, and then people that would come funneling down because it was a very small map with a lot of tight corridors, <laughs> and guys would just come running through. We're just like, D -d -d -d. I mean, you would drop them real quick. <laughs> You're like, oh my god, this is sweet. I love this. <laughs> so I mean, there there are a lot of good things about the Destiny Two beta. There's a lot of good things coming out of it. Are there, you know, like you said, we're still trying to get our heads around and figure out if this is the right way to go about the weapons for PVE. Uh, Benner, you were talking about one of the grenades just isn't doing uh doing his thing anymore, man. <sighs> yes, I'm so disappointed. The um the fusion grenades for warlocks with the the Dawnblade subclass. You know, you with the Sun Singer. You could use a fusion grenade in PvP, stick it to someone, it'd be a one-hit kill. No more. It doesn't even take down their shield all the way now. <laughs> it's it's so weak and it's and it's yeah, it's so disappointing. It made me sad. And I think the other issue I had with with the with the PvP, and I don't know if I really noticed it too much in PvE, but in PvP, the power weapons, uh, they, th those need a buff, especially the grenade launchers. I mean, I'm sitting there dropping yeah. grenades at people's feet, and it's barely breaking their shield, and I'm just like. You know, if I only get like four shots of this thing, I, I, and it's a power weapon, it takes at least two grenades yeah. with a grenade launcher to kill someone. Yeah, so I, I think that needs uh, needs to be looked at, and I, and I think that's something they are looking into. Uh, ben, you got some uh, stuff here we're going to talk about uh, here in a moment, but um, it is mm -hmm. stuff that they're looking into. Like I said, this this is why I'm glad they ran a beta. You know, not only does this game run good technically. They, they were able to identify a lot of issues. The community was able to kind of voice their opinions, and, and Bungie's taking it to heart, and they're looking at it, and they're investigating it, and there's going to be some changes uh, prior to uh, when the game launches. Yeah. Let's uh let's get into that stuff right now that, that that you were talking about, Brent. So Bungie had the update this week, came out yesterday or the day before. Um, you know, they put out the Bungie update every week. Obviously, this week was focused on the Destiny 2 beta. So we have a couple quotes we want to read here from a few of the guys involved with the beta, and they kind of get at some of the stuff that we're talking about here. So first off, we have, we have producer Jared Burback. I'm going to hope I said his name right. This is what he had to say. Uh, quote, the beta has been amazingly helpful for our development team. The analogy I always give is that the beta is the plow on the front of the train that blasts all of the snow off the tracks to clear our path. <laughs> We had many updates to the original, but Destiny 2 is a brand new game using brand new technology in order to deliver an awesome experience. This new technology needs a lot of testing. This testing ultimately helps us validate our new server model is working as we thought it would and at the quality and scale we had hoped. It helps us evaluate our new tech advancements, including enhancements you'll understand more fully when you play the full game. Ultimately, it paves the way for us to have a much smoother launch. So, you know, this is something that we've heard about for a while now that, you know, the the new engine they've been developing for Destiny 2, that there's a lot of new things that they're going to do with this game. Not, not only in terms of how they, you know, bring us content or they're able to deliver it faster now with this new system they have set up, mm -hmm. but in the way that they're going to matchmake and set up PvP as well. So, uh, um, you know, that's kind of what Jared was getting at there. Now from beta design lead Rob Engelm, he had this to say, quote, Aside from testing our processes and services, the beta is also an opportunity for us to collect feedback and data to help us close out the final tuning for the game. We're watching and playing with you. 
Thank you for sharing your experiences and helping make the launch version of Destiny 2 that much better. The PvE game tuning has changed pretty significantly since the beta build was deployed. The nature of a beta of this scale requires that it's based off a build of the game that is now months old. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, your feedback is helping us validate the changes that were previously made based on internal feedback and playtesting. For example, we too felt that ammo, especially power ammo, was too scarce in PvE. In addition to retuning the drop rates, we built a system that guarantees power ammo drops for you and your fire team from certain enemies, giving power weapons a more reliable and predictable role in your arsenal. Other areas where we've made significant tuning changes include grenade effectiveness in PvE, boss vitality, and weapon damage against non-player combatants. So Brent, this is a lot of what we just talked about here. Mm -hmm. Power ammo, like like guaranteed power ammo from certain enemies. So I'd imagine like a yellow barred enemy. Mm -hmm. like when you kill one of them, they would leave power ammo behind like as a guaranteed thing. Uh, you know, tuning the grenade effectiveness like we talked about. The vitality of the boss. The boss at the end of that strike, he's got... <laughs> He's got a lot of life, and when you, when you when you don't have access to a power weapon because the ammo is not dropping and you're just firing on him with your auto rifle over and over and over, and mm -hmm. you can't get close enough to this guy to really do heavy damage or be in the optimal range for that weapon, it takes mm -hmm. a long time to drop that son of a bitch. So, um, so that that's that's something that's good for them to look at, and that, that's something else I'm worried about with that weapon system too, man. Is if if they don't fix that power ammo thing and we don't have access to that, like it's going to be tough to bring down some of these bigger enemies because mm -hmm. we don't have access to like the the big firepower arsenal that we're used to. And so, so you uh, need that you need that yeah. for that sense of badassery when you're playing this yeah. game. I mean, if you if you're sitting there just shooting an assault rifle the entire match, that's going to get repetitious. That's actually going to you're not going to feel any kind of like real excitement from that. It's just going to feel like a grind. Where if you're able to pick up a power ammo and, and snipe the boss in the face six times and you watch that hell drop, that gives you that sense of badassery. Like, you know, I'm badass. I'm dropping this guy. I'm doing my part. It kind of helps you change the tide of the battle and kind of and it changes things up dramatically. Definitely. That that goes into the abilities as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we we were talking about it in, in PvP, but it's present in PVE as well. Where you just your super doesn't charge fast enough. Mm -mm. Your your grenades don't don't charge fast enough. Routinely, we would go through an entire PvP match not access our super one time. So that needs to change. Mm -hmm. uh, the grenades don't don't recharge fast enough. Like I'm fighting the, during the strike. I'm killing a group of enemies. Then like a gladiator comes out and like running towards me with these cleavers. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, let me throw a grenade at him. I haven't thrown one in a while and the thing's still not recharged. Right. So I'm like, I'm like, geez. All right. So, you know, whether this is just the fact that this is not a fully leveled up character and, and some of those things might might come into play later, I don't know. See, that's but, that's my that's what I was wondering. It was like maybe as yeah. you get better gear and obviously like in yeah. Destiny One, you'll you'll increase those those cooldown times. And, and, and maybe that's the case here because, like you said, we're playing with very low level characters and, and, and our, none of our gear had any kind of like real special abilities to it. So maybe that's why. But, you know, hey, if they if that's not the case, then hopefully they are tuning that to be, you know, so we can use those things a little bit more frequently. Yeah. And that uh, and, you know, the, the armor and stuff doesn't change that anymore. You know, it, it affects mm. your your life and your mobility and that kind of stuff. But it mm. doesn't affect like super cool down anymore unless there's. So, some other system that does that i don't i don't know well, yet i mean if we look at all i mean bender pointed out in their stream too is like all these gears all these all this gear has different slots so maybe there's stuff that we'll be able to insert in those slots yeah that'll increase those cooldowns mm -hmm. or decrease goes, them i guess yeah and that goes back to that whole thing like there's a lot about this game that we don't know mm -hmm. and it's probably not going to be the way the game exactly plays when it comes out um what, what do you think about what what the some of the designers are saying here though bender i mean this is a lot of the stuff that we wanted to hear from them right i thought it was especially interesting and something i didn't think about but the fact that this is a version of the game that's months and months old now like they they had to kind of certify this gold and get it ready for the for the beta launch but they've recognized a lot of this stuff as they're playing it and they're already tweaking this stuff and they're kind of we're kind of reaffirming what what their what their thoughts were on it so what, what do you uh, what do you what are your thoughts on this um yeah i i think it's good that they're uh continu continuously continuously fine tuning um different things like that and they notice that there are issues that need to be worked on so that's good um you know so hopefully we'll see some some higher drop rates on the uh power ammo in the final game and better grenades <laughs> and stuff like that it'd be nice definitely need some better <laughs> better grenades yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, because right now grenades just they just don't feel strong enough um, mm-hmm. in all in all aspects of the game. Right. So that's <laughs> and that's a huge difference from Destiny, where those things are very powerful. Like when you drop a grenade in a group of enemies, they're all going down no matter what. If you if you drop a grenade on somebody in the crucible and you hit them like dead center, like they're they're not getting up from that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's good good to hear that they're at least looking at this stuff. Now uh, speaking of the crucible. Crucible design lead Lars Bakken had this to say, uh, quote, hello everyone, Lars from the Crucible team here, aka Thug Lars on the internet, well, what's up Thug <laughs> Lars, uh, we really hope you're enjoying the beta, even though it's just a taste of the full game, we believe it delivers a good preview of what you'll experience this fall, as you play your first matches in the Destiny 2 Crucible, you're probably wondering how matchmaking will work, before we delve into the details, allow me to share our core design principles for the Crucible and Destiny 2. One, provide a great experience for players who enjoy competitive PvP activities. And two, ensure that players who enjoy PvP have fair and fun matches. Seems like two reasonable things to, uh, you know, attest to with with a (laughs) PvP design. Uh, We're designing the Crucible for people who live for that competitive fire that wells up in their soul every time they're challenged. That's important to us. So what's new for matchmaking in Destiny 2? The obvious PvP evolutions are the 4v4 format and the two consolidated playlists. We hope these changes have a good impact on game quality. Destiny 2 Crucible matchmaking places a greater emphasis on connection quality, but make no mistake, skill is still a big component in finding worthy opponents for you to fight. When all these systems are singing in unison, it should help us reach our ultimate goal, to give all players, regardless of their skill, the best possible experience. While the new quick play and competitive modes are designed to serve different moods, they are using the same matchmaking settings in the beta. We'll be able to tune these separately post-beta, and your playtesting will help us going forward. For those of you who are wondering, we bucket you separately depending on the playlist, so your quick play skill is tracked separately from your competitive skill. Hmm. Uh, basically, the long and the short of this is, we're always trying to make sure your connection is solid, while also making sure we give you as fair a match as possible. Thanks again for helping us beta test the game. We'll see you star side, end quote. So I thought there's some interesting stuff in here, Brent. So we have, um, first of all, they're use, they're they're tackling matchmaking a little bit differently, mm-hmm. and you know, I, it's a lot of Destiny One was based around skill based matchmaking, and sometimes that led to not the best connections with people because some people who had the most skill had the poorest connections. <laughs> so um, there is they're trying to combine that because I I I do think there is a need to have some form of skill-based matchmaking like you mm-hmm. have to have some type of competitive balance in these matches so if they've been able to find a way to skill matchmake as well as base it on connection quality and they can somehow find the best of both worlds like that's awesome um i thought it was interesting too that i didn't even think about this until i read this but the quick play and the competitive are two different settings that are going to be in the final game and in the beta you know, quick play is control, and the competitive is the is the countdown mode. Mm-hmm. But I didn't it didn't register in my mind that these were going to be different different buckets of people in the final version of the game. So while the matchmaking is is using the same settings in the beta, once we get to the final game, like if you jump into quick play, like you're gonna have different settings and different kind of stats than you mm-hmm. will when you jump into competitive. So it's going to track you two different ways, mm-hmm. and hopefully that'll kind of weed out the people who want to play with a certain type of people. If you're more of a casual player, you're in the quick play playlist. If you're really like hardcore competitive, you get into the competitive playlist. Mm-hmm. So uh, I thought that was an interesting change as well that I, that didn't strike me when I was playing the game initially. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we came away uh, pretty impressed with the beta in terms of like technical technical uh, aspects go. Like I said, it ran great. Jumping in and out of multiplayer was 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 quick. I mean, it was really fast. We go to orbit, select the mode, boom, we're right back into the match and ready to go. So that part of it was great. The game looked beautiful on the PlayStation 4 Pro. Uh, looked fantastic. Obviously, we we had four uh, PS4 Pro enhancements going on in the beta, and it looked it looked great. So really happy to see that in there. Um, you know, we've got our concerns, we've got some reservations, but. Uh, Bungie still has plenty of time to address these issues, and, and and based on these comments that they're making here, we can expect some changes prior to launch. But um, basically, after playing this, you know, I, I'm ready, dude. I played the Homecoming mission four times, three on PS4, <laughs> once on Xbox One. It never got old. It was intense. It was exciting. It was fun. It was cool to see old characters. It was awesome to finally meet Gaul, who is seriously just an awesome villain early on. I mean, you, you can tell... 
that he he holds a grudge against the Guardians uh, getting access to the light. I mean, he he tells him he's like, look, you don't deserve this, and that was awesome. Hearing him talk like that, you can kind of get a sense of where he's coming from and what kind of villain he's going to be. And overall, I just I can't wait to play through the campaign this time around. Also has probably the best voice ever. You're not brave. You've merely forgotten the fear of death. Allow me to reacquaint you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an intimidating voice. So, yeah, I mean, my gosh, that guy's an intimidating dude. He sure is. Uh, so that that's our uh, Destiny 2 beta impressions. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we, we, like I said, we're, we're really excited for the game and we liked what we saw. So now let's get it back into the proper podcast. Boyce, what's coming out this week, buddy? Let's hop into the new releases and uh, yeah, can't wait for Destiny 2, man. Can't wait to get uh, Franklin in there as well. I know, right? It's going to be good times, especially the, the, the PvP. The, squad. the PvP is 4v4 now. So now it'll be on us. If we suck, we can't be like, man, it's these two other dudes that joined our match. Nope. If we get wrecked like we did in in, in Countdown, <laughs> it's going to be our fault. But no, I, I, I thought the 4v4, was, 4v4 setup was actually pretty good. I'm going to blame the other three people on my team. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I actually, I actually won a match at Countdown today. It was pretty exciting. Did you? So Yeah. yeah got in there. Nice. Got in there with the team and, and took some took some dudes out. Countdown was like my trials of Osiris. It was just like, man, are we gonna win? A, are we gonna win a round? But we did win a round. I think we won two rounds, so that was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and those those warlock circles very useful in that mode as well when you're Big capturing time. capturing points and trying to trying to pr- protect those. But anyway, mm-hmm. let's get to those new releases like you were talking about, Brent. We'll start here with PlayStation. We'll try and move through these quickly. This is a gigantic list. We have a lot of news to talk about as well. A lot of stuff happened this week. So starting on the PlayStation side of things, uh, one thing I want to mention from last week, uh, Arcade Archives, Neo Geo, King of Monsters, available now. So those Arcade Archives just keep pumping along and and sneaking out every single week. So that one's available now. Now for the titles that are coming out this week, the biggest title in my personal opinion is Sundered, which is a Friday release, July 28th. Brent, I cannot wait to get my hands on this game. I mean, seriously, the the art style in this game speaks to me in in a way that few other games do. Like, this is a game I just look at, and it's a game I just want to play because of the way it looks. Just mm-hmm. an incredibly beautiful hand drawn art style, a Metroidvania game from the creators of Jotun. Um, you know, RPG progression mechanics, gigantic bosses. I mean, seriously, this was like a game that was made for me. Mm-hmm. So. I, I I backed this on Kickstarter, so I should have the game come Friday at midnight. So can't wait to uh, to get in here and get my hands on it. What say you, Mister Felson? Pump, dude! I'm really psyched to check this game out. You know, I played a little bit of the beta on PC. Um, it's a beautiful looking game. There's not a whole lot. There wasn't a whole lot to the beta. Uh, they removed a lot of uh, like object objectives and, and story elements. Uh, I don't think there were any story elements to it from what little I did play, but. Uh, this is a beautiful looking game, and, and, and Thunder Lotus proved show, showed to us uh, with, with Jotun that they're a very talented developer. They specialize in boss battles. There were some great boss battles in Jotun, and it looks like there's going to be some more here in Sundered. So, yeah, mm-hmm. dude, I, I'm ready for this to drop on Friday for sure. We, I think, we, we all back this, right? <laughs> all oh, yeah, except I, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One but, terrible right. person on this podcast. <laughs> Still gonna buy it. <laughs> okay. All right. Make sure you make sure you pre order too because you get a discount on it for, for pre ordering it. So mm, hop in there yes. and do that before Friday. Franklin, there was an eighteen minute segment of Sundered on PlayStation's E three show this year that I thought was just stunning. It was one of the best things I watched uh during the whole weekend or the whole week that, that E three was running. How excited are you for Sundered, man? I'm really excited. I'm actually kind of mad because I have to work this weekend, this <laughs> upcoming weekend. So, oh, I I want to hop into it on Friday, but I I can already tell it's going to be a game I'm not going to want to put down when I start playing it. So, starting at Friday night, having to get up at about six in the morning on Saturday is probably a really bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> I might still do it. I who knows? But <laughs> I I can't wait. I can't wait. The second I have a chance to sit down and play through the game, I'm taking it. Well, dude, hop in there and get a few deaths out of the way. Because as you die, you're gonna progress your character. So you know you're gonna you're gonna die initially a lot. So you might as well yeah. get in there, get a few of those out of the way, get the get some skills, get some weapons, whatever whatever you're gonna get in this game. And then uh, by the time you sit down to play, you'll be that much closer to 
progressing a little bit further. <laughs> Solid. I like it. Yeah. I'm here for you, man. <laughs> Bender. So what do you think, man? Sundered's coming out. You played it a little bit at, at PAX South. Um, I, I know you, you enjoyed what you played. You excited mm-hmm. to, to play it this Friday when it comes out? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really cool game. Love the art style of the, the uh, action of it. Uh, different up- upgradable powers and all that stuff. Seemed really cool. I didn't get to try out a, a boss battle, but it, it, the demo I played ended like right as you got to this huge boss. So I mm. can't wait to see what the boss battles are like. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it seems like a really really cool game. Nice. Yeah, I watched uh, I watched him play that first boss on the uh, or some some of the first boss on that on that E three stream, and it, it looks pretty intense. So obviously Thunder Lotus has a has a gift when it comes to boss battles. That's one of the things I'm looking forward to most: is getting in there and playing these giant baddies that they've concocted for this thing absolutely cannot wait for that game though it's coming out this friday if it if it would have came out on tuesday it would have been on the tuesday night indie spotlight but it wasn't so in its place will be pyre which is super giants next game mm. um and that's coming out this week as well so uh obviously these are the guys behind bastion and transistor pyre is a, a very very interesting looking title another game which just an absolutely gorgeous art style i mean the the clean line animation that super giant has on their games is is really really pretty really beautiful to look at pyre looks awesome in motion it's an rpg game based around this kind of ancient uh it's just like ancient competition that they have in this purgatory setting where all of these people are trying to kind of make their way out of purgatory so it seems like it's gonna have an interesting story an interesting group of characters uh another game that's always looked really cool from when i when i've watched it play um, Frankie, what do you what do you think of Pyre, man? Coming out this Tuesday, uh, it actually looks really cool. There's a, um, I think it's like a nine minute video up on the PlayStation blog right now, but it's uh, it shows off on the multiplayer matches, which I think I, I Bender mentioned it was local only. I'm pretty sure he's right. I thought I read somewhere it was online, but mm. I'm probably mistaken. But anyways, it, it looks really cool. You know, it's uh, it's kind of got like a you, this is this orb that drops, and you're basically you have three members on your team, and you have different abilities for each character. Um, like they were kind of talking about, you meet all these characters as you play through the campaign. Like the campaign was the main focus of this game. Uh, it's the, the most characters they've ever put in a game. Um, so you kind of meet them. Some of them are bosses in the campaign, but you kind of build like your dream team to, uh, you know, compete. You could play against, I think it's just local players. You play against the AI, but the, uh, the, the way the, uh, matches play out is actually pretty cool. There's this orb that drops. So, mm-hmm. um, you have your three players and you're trying to kind of, you could pass this orb around between, you know, your, your, uh, the two players you have active on the team. And then, you know, you have like moves you can do to take out other players, but you're essentially just trying to get to like this goalpost and you can throw it in. You can, um, or I think you could just run it in. It looked like, so yeah, it looks like it get pretty intense as you start getting mm-hmm. closer to, uh, <laughs> your, your uh, first two, uh, 100 points. So I think it counts down from a hundred. So looks pretty intense i can't wait to get in there and try it out yeah it's like a uh i don't know like a demonic version of handball or something like yeah. that it's uh <laughs> yeah it, it looks really neat one thing i'm unclear of frankie is exactly how this game plays like are there like exploration or traditional rpg segments in this game or, or is it just like story outside of these you know um matches that you're getting into uh, that, that's one thing i'm unclear of and, and that i'm curious to see when i actually play the game is how the structure of the game is i'm not sure i, I from what i gathered when i initially was hearing about the game there's it sounds like there's some exploration because there's like a language to all this that you're mm-hmm. learning as you progress through the campaign so i would assume you're yeah at least doing some kind of exp, you know, exploration but yeah. we'll see I, I assume that as well because they've always built this as like a party based like RPG game, and if if it was just like these comp competitive uh, sports segments in the game, then I'm sure they would have built it as something different. So the fact that they've always referred to this as an RPG with a story and with you know this campaign that's going on, I'm sure there's going to be some element of exploration or something outside of these matches that they've that they've displayed on a lot of these streams. I, I'm starting to, to get a sense of what the game is, but like for the longest time, I had no idea what it was, but mm-hmm. I was still interested in it just because it's made by Supergiant. Yeah. I loved Bastion so much, and um, Transistor was awesome as well. So I'm, I'm sure this game is going to be good. So I'm, I'm gonna pick it up just on the merits of that studio. But yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm definitely interested in just, you know really learning uh, the mechanics of the game and everything. Definitely. Yeah, soundtrack I think is available now. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, you know that's going to be good, too. (laughs) (laughs) Darren Corb is awesome. Mm -hmm. Pyre also has a discount right now if you pre-order the game. So if you are interested in Pyre, make sure you get that in before Tuesday. And once again, we'll feature this on the Tuesday Night Indie Spotlight, 10 p.m. Eastern, on our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you tune in then, and we'll uh, play it, see what it's all about. And look forward to that. Uh, another another super cool in game. This is this is a great week for games. Uh, super Cloud Built is out this mm-hmm. Tuesday as well. Now, Brent, you streamed a little bit of this game this week. We have the first 15 minutes up on our website, up on our YouTube page. You can come mm-hmm. out see what this game's all about. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Super Cloud Built? Yeah, it's it's there's not the story is very um, mysterious early on. Like you're basically you're, you play this girl named Demi, and you kind of wake up in this like it's almost like it's like a hospital of sorts outside of her body like you're, you're kind of like this outer body experience uh you see yourself laying in this hospital hospital bed but then you're like kind of exploring through these strange worlds and there's a whole lot of parkour parkour is how you make your way through these levels there's enemies you have to uh you know avoid there's hazards you got to move around but it's a very fast-paced game uh the parkour system works pretty good the controls are a little loose i'm still trying to get my head around those um but it's it's again it's it's very fast paced, beautiful art style. Like I said, mm-hmm. it's very similar to what we saw from John to Death or something you would see in Borderlands. Just a very very pretty art style. Runs smooth. It's a very smooth game. It's playing on the Xbox One, sixty frames. Uh, and like I said, very 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 fast paced. I haven't played a whole lot of it yet, but uh, from what I played early on, it's very very good. But the um, the controls uh, take some getting used to. So just based on your early impressions, is this something that you would you recommend early on? Um, I, I honestly haven't played it enough to, to be able to go one way or the other. Okay. I'm curious because this is another game that uh, that I believe has a has a pre-order discount on it right now. It does. Mm-hmm. Super interested in this one. I'm just curious if I should pull the trigger or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so keep our eyes on that. But yeah, Super Cloud Bill, another, another really, really good looking game this week. Uh, Fortnite, we mentioned last week, it was in kind of the early access thing for it um so once again it's kind of official releases this tuesday i mean it's, it's not official it's kind of still the early access version. this this is a confusing ass game is what i'm getting at here so whatever <laughs> whatever version of this game is coming out tuesday it'll be out tuesday you can get it digitally or at retail and uh once again this is some type of a uh cooperative base building crafting avoiding monsters type of a game <laughs> so uh We'll see what that's all about. Frankie, did you end up getting this? No. Um, I watched a couple of streams. Oh, did you? And yeah, this looks like if you're playing by yourself, it's probably not a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But if you, you know, gather a team of three friends, uh, might be a good time. I don't know. It just, uh, the whole, like, it, it just reminds me of all the amp cooking stuff from Sunset Overdrive. And I, nah, I'm just not interested. It mm-hmm. looks fun. Like, the gameplay looks fun. Like, actually shooting these uh monsters or zombies or whatever they are like mm-hmm. looks really fun but the whole like, building forts to keep them out ugh. <laughs> yeah reading reading about the game sounds like there's some cool systems in there in terms of the mechanics that they have built into it so i've i don't know that i've ever quite played a game um like this i don't i don't know that i have a frame of reference to it but it, it sounds interesting enough from what i've read of it the other thing that confuses me about this game is there's a free download on the PlayStation Store right now and i don't know what that is like when you go on there, there's a Fortnite that you can download for free. I don't, I don't know what that is. I downloaded it today, just, just out of curiosity. I don't, I don't know what it is, but um, maybe if anybody knows, they can let us know. <laughs> Pod, <laughs> podcast at shortpods dot com. Let us know what the hell the free Fortnite download is. Um, all right, moving on from there. Uh, Infinite Mini Golf, which is a game I think looks really cool. It's from Zen Studios. I never played Planet Mini Golf, which was their their previous gen game. This kind of takes that idea and just blows it up to the next level. There's basically, like it says, there's an infinite number of mini golf courses that are going to be on here. I just think mini golf in a video game just sounds really really fun, especially when <laughs> Zen Studios is doing it. And it's it's kind of like the play create share of mini golf. So there's going to be an endless number of courses that people are going to come up with, and uh, I think this game sounds rad. Um, so that'll be out this Tuesday. Avon Colony or Avon Colony, however you say this, is the this kind of sci-fi city building game that'll be out Tuesday. Constructors, a Friday release, another city building game. Circuit Breakers, a pretty cool looking like 16-bit twin stick shooter. Looks like Smash TV kind of almost. Really like the way that one looks. That's one to keep your eyes on. A uh, Pressure Overdrive is an overhead like uh, combat racing game. That'll be out Tuesday. Unbox Newbie's Adventure. <laughs> 
a strange game about a sentient parcel that kind of uh, bounces his little cardboard box self around the levels and uses physics to get from one one point to another. Uh, actually, a really good looking game. Um, so that that one's interesting. Uh, Vostok Inc. is a, uh, a twin stick space shooter. Also looks good. That's a Wednesday release. A healer only lives twice. He is <laughs> is not the latest James Bond film. I can confirm. Aww. This is <laughs> this is a a a dungeon crawler based around healing strategy. So you have a knight that's fighting enemies. And you have to actually heal the knight as you're as you're going through there. So you play the role of the healer. Uh, Active Soccer Two DX is an overhead soccer game. It's crossed by with the Vita. Leaving Lindo it appears to be a walking simulator. This is. Maybe something along the lines of uh, the vanishing of Ethan Carter or Wander, or, something like or that. Wander, Shh. yeah, Shh. yeah, just just like that. <laughs> so that's out Thursday. Ooh. Lost Grimoire, Stolen Kingdom. I mean, seriously, dude, how many people work at Artifacts Monday? There is seriously one of these games coming out every single week. <laughs> you know, it's it's all insane. Just the same game. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. Um, but that'll be out Tuesday. A uh, Rugby Live Four is a Friday yes. release. Yonder the Cloudcatcher Chronicles is getting a retail release this Tuesday. It's only available at GameStop, so if you're interested, make sure you hop over there and check that out. Uh, Pro Evolution Soccer 2018 has an online beta that's going on right now until July 30th, so make sure you check that out if you're interested. Dead Alliance hits open beta this Thursday, July 27th. It goes until Monday. I hadn't, even heard, of, I hadn't even heard of this game until I was putting the new release list together. Frankie, you seem to have an opinion on this. Just tell us about Dead Alliance. I don't know anything about it. The only thing I do know about it is the publisher logo. It's Maximum in the Games. Of the box. <laughs> yeah. So. It is no a Maximum bar. Games joint. Uh, it looks to be, it's it. I'm not sure what it is. It it looks to be some type of a, a zombie first person shooter. I don't know if it's cooperative or if it's like a horde mode type of thing. But, uh, you know, th- this game's coming out sometime in August. This uh, really could have, couldn't have any less interest in that title. Um, Same. Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy actually got the Stormy Ascent DLC this week, and it's free right now if you have the game. Uh, it's free throughout the for for the next few it's, weeks at least. I think it's, it's throughout uh, the month of August. August twenty first is when August twenty first. Yeah. So make sure you I go out, it. download this. I think this is awesome. This is a level that they originally cut from the original Crash Bandicoot because they deemed it too hard. So Vicarious Visions <laughs> went in there. They finished the level. They revamped it for for the Insane Trilogy, and they put it out as a free piece of DLC. I think that's awesome. I, I actually really want to get in there and play through that. Uh, Doom's 6.66 update is available now, which makes the <laughs> DLC free. And, That's awesome. And it kind of reworks the multiplayer progression system in the game. Uh, Euro Fishing Foundry Dock DLC is available now. Tricky Towers, the Indie Friends character pack, which has a bunch of cool indie characters in there. That's available now. Uh, Balloons TD5, the Odyssey mode, is available now. Uh, Street Fighter Alpha 5 getting its Abigail character DLC this Tuesday. So this is the fourth character in the Season 2 pack. Um, this was Street Fighter Alpha 5. Did I say Street Fighter Alpha 5? You sure wow. did. I was I was thinking Abigail Final Fight, and it registered me back to like Street Fighter Alpha <laughs> for some reason. But Street Fighter 5, not Alpha 5. That's not a thing. Um, yet. The car- the, yeah, yeah. The robot on Power Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. <laughs> that's true. My kids were uh, were trying to watch Power Rangers earlier, so maybe that's in my mind as well. That's but uh, <laughs> but yeah, Abigail was unveiled at Evo. Um, which, by the way, if you haven't watched Evo, we have our page up on the site. The entire tournament is archived on there. So if you miss anything, go in there and check it out. We even have some of the side tournaments in there. It's so, like I have the Dragon Ball Fighters side tournament is archived on there. If you want to watch that, um, there was a, I think there was a Soul Calibur tournament that I put on there as well, taking it back. So if you're uh, Interested? If you missed any of the Evo action, hop in there and check that out. Hey, hey, Ben, how many yeah. little Mac matches were there in the finals for Smash Brothers? <laughs> um, I don't know, Frankie. Why don't you tell me? None. Oh, it's crazy. Weird. It's weird, it's weird. right? It's yeah, a hard character. No one's using. Dude, it's a hard character to master. <laughs> Not everyone can just jump in there and dominate with little Mac. <laughs> hmm. But uh, yeah, Abigail was was unveiled during Evo. Abigail's a, a really cool looking character. This dude is eight feet tall. He's a bruiser. Has a, a a ton of range. Actually, has the most health out of any character in the game. So he's got some unique traits to him that are gonna, I think, make him a player in the in the competitive scene for Street Fighter Five. Uh, Neo's Defiant Honor DLC will be out this Tuesday. New area, new bosses, new trophies. What more do you need? Another game that uh, I shamefully have not played. Uh, and Mafia 3, Sign of the Times DLC, the third and final 
<laughs> DLC pack for Mafia Three will be out this Tuesday. Frankie, you hopping in, man? Going going back to New even, Bordeaux. I don't I don't even have a copy of that game anymore. <laughs> oh, just just gave up on it. Cool. Uh, all right, moving on. PSVR has a lot of titles coming out this week. First of all, the Idol Master Cinderella Girls Revolution is available now. Brent, I'm sure you own this three times over at this point. It's a uh, idols singing like rhythm game. Um, how about this one? Tiny Tracks, the latest game from Future Lab, who is a, a developer that a lot of us on this podcast really like. This is their first stab at a VR game for PSVR, and it's based around slot car racing. Um, this looks like a, a really, really fun game. Brent, what do you what do you think, man? What do what are your thoughts on Tiny Tracks? I'm really curious about this one. Obviously, big fan of Future Lab. Um, yeah. And really curious to see what this is like, uh, the, seeing these race cars kind of like racing around you in game. You mm-hmm. kind of get like this God's eye view of like this racetrack and all yeah. this racing that's going on. So that's what I kind of like about VR. I mean, yes, obviously, first person experiences are, is what everyone thinks VR is all about. But as we saw when we first started firing up PlayStation VR, we had that one mode where um, in the, the playroom where you could play as like a third person perspective. And I was like, oh, this does work. You know, you don't just have to be in first person to enjoy VR, to enjoy being in a space. This is another opportunity to play a game outside of just the first person that we're all used to. You're kind of like looking down, watching this race unfold all around you. It looks pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, but like I said, I really, really, I'm with you, man. I really, really like Future Lab as well. I, I, this game looks like a lot of fun. I really, really want to test this one out this week. Um, speaking, of, speaking of games that look Awesome. How about this Theseus game, dude? So yes. you were telling me about this earlier today. This comes out on Wednesday. This looks like some kind of a... It, it, it's a third-person adventure game in VR. It's got some some dark, almost like a Dark Souls feel to it. I don't know what the combat is, is going to be like, but... Mm-hmm. Brent, tell me about this Theseus game, dude. There, there's not a whole lot to take from the trailer. I mean, you're, you're basically this character. You just keep waking up. It's almost like you play out like Groundhog Day. You got to explore this labyrinth, this setup all around you. There's puzzles you got to solve. There's a boss that's like 35 feet tall compared to your character that you're going to have mm-hmm. to encounter. And again, you're playing it from a third person perspective. The character will be in front of you as you're playing, but you'll be able to look all around this labyrinth that you're making your way through. Like I said, there's there's not a lot to take from the trailer, but it looks beautiful. It looks like a really good looking game. And I'll be really mm-hmm. curious to see how this plays uh, an adventure game plays in VR. And it's based around this this idea of the Minotaur and the Minotaur's labyrinth and the the riddle of the Minotaur mm-hmm. back from uh, uh, I think it was Greek mythology that that this character was in. Mm-hmm. But uh, I I remember this from an episode of Batman the Animated Series. There was an episode where the Riddler had the riddle of the Minotaur, and he put Batman into this maze, and he had to kind of work his way through. So I feel like that's what this game's going to be. You're in some type of a maze setting, trying to w- murk your way towards the Minotaur somewhere in there, and mm-hmm. eventually confront it, which, which sounds pretty awesome. Frankie, have you seen this game? No, I didn't even know anything about it until Brett mentioned it to me the other day. Um, mm-hmm. It sounds interesting. It sounds like something I would really like. So I'm going to kind of wait and see what he has to say about it before I uh, pull the trigger. But, yeah, it sounds awesome. I'll have a yeah. video of this up this week for sure. Yes. Yeah. Super, uh, super curious about this one. That's a Wednesday release once again. Uh, Hero of the Seven Seas is like a pirate VR game. Uh, Infinite Mini Golf is actually going to be on VR as well, so that's cool. And Smashbox Arena is a kind of team shooter game that's going to be available on PSVR this week as well. That's a lot of titles for PSVR this week, so they're, uh, they're cranking those things out at a nice clip. On to the Vita now. Uh, Collar Across Malice is a uh, very interesting sounding visual novel that's hitting the Vita on Friday this week. Active Soccer 2 DX once again is crossed by with the PS4. That'll be out Tuesday. It's Spring Again is a Friday release, which is a uh, sounds like an educational game aimed at players two and up to teach them about the seasons. If this thing has a if this thing has a platinum trophy, like this is a guaranteed purchase. Um, and <laughs> And Polara will be on the Vita this week, which is uh, an infinite runner from mobile making its way over to the Vita. Before you move on, uh, just a couple of things from Limited Run this week. Uh, two, both these games actually pretty awesome. So uh, Ocean Horn is coming out for PS4 and Vita. Um, I don't remember run sizes for them. I think there's in the 3,000 range. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 3,000 copies for uh, Ocean Horn. I believe that's on both platforms. I think, and, uh, um, I think that one's going to go quick probably. Oh, I was uh, yeah, I'm anticipating it will as well. Uh, Forty thousand might even be a little short 
for that mm-hmm. one, in my opinion. But uh, awesome. And uh, the other one is uh, Plague Road, which uh, oh, nice. PS4 and Vita. That one's limited to 2,800 copies, but uh, apparently when this game was on <clears throat> Kickstarter, there was a, uh, a physical version of the game that Limited Run was handling. So of these 2,800 copies, the Kickstarter copies come out of that total. So there's actually going to be mm-hmm. less than this available. So mm-hmm. if you're interested in Plague Road, want to see it what play road is come to our youtube channel uh ben did the uh tuesday indie spotlight of this a couple weeks ago this game looks awesome so this is cool one that i'm probably gonna try to pick up but yeah if you're into physical games limited run games.com look for those on friday thank you franklin yeah and i uh play road is a really cool game i want to play some more of that one really liked what i played of it so far though it's a very very interesting title yeah uh, i picked that one up this week in the sale 7.99 it's like hell yeah, yeah. nice yeah, kick-ass sale going on PSN right now. Um, literally, just, they're like they're in the middle of this like huge sale that they put out as part of this promotion, and then on the weekend they do a flash sale as well. Just like, <laughs> dude, are you just trying to take like every single dollar I have in the bank? Is that yes. really what you're trying to do here? I mean, good, good grief, man. Um, all right, let's move on to the Xbox now. So available right now, Euro Fishing Foundry Dock DLC is on there. Uh, Arcade Archives Neo Geo Z Blade, which I believe is a, um, a shooter. Uh, it might be a fighting game. I can't, can't remember. But Z Blade's available now. Um, now, what's coming this week? We we talked about Fortnite on the PS4. That'll be on the Xbox One as well. Fable Fortune, uh, finally making its way over to the Xbox this week. Got delayed a couple weeks. It'll be an Xbox game preview. It's some type of uh, you know card battling, Hearthstone type of game set in the Fable universe. Avon Colony will be on the Xbox this week alongside Infinite Mini Golf, Circuit Breakers, and Constructor. Unbox Newbie's Adventure is a Wednesday release. Uh, Grid Retro Enhanced is a Wednesday release as well. This is actually a, a pretty cool looking, almost Tron looking futuristic uh, shoot 'em up. Hmm. Really, really, really interesting looking game there. Pressure Overdrive, once again, the, the top down combat, car combat game, is a Wednesday release. Canadian Football 2017 is a Wednesday release. <laughs> and, yeah, it looks like a low-budget Madden game. Uh, Vostok Inc. is coming over to Xbox as well on Wednesday. Super Cloud Built a Friday release. Cyber Complex, the kind of hacking puzzle game, is available on Friday. And Syndrome, first-person horror game, psychological horror game, survival horror game, whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, is coming out Friday, July 28th. On the DLC front, the Doom updates over on the Xbox as well. The uh, Dead Alliance open beta will be over there on Thursday. And Mafia 3, Sign of the Times, that DLC will be available Tuesday. Let's move into Bender's World now with Nintendo. Let's check in with the Switch and see what we missed last week. Uh, Boost Beast is a $9.99 eShop title. It's available now for purchase. Alongside Arcade Archives Neo Geo Samurai Showdown. So the classic fighting game is on there now for $7.99. This week on the Switch, Infinite Mini Golf will be over there as well. Um, the one thing I should mention too about Infinite Mini Golf that's cool is is all of the courses that are shared are cross platform. So whether you're on Steam or the Switch or the PS4, or the Xbox One, all of the courses that are created and kind of put wow. into the ether are available on all the different platforms. So if you were to take your Switch with you on the go uh, and, and make a course or whatever, you could theoretically come home and, and play it on your PS4. Or Frankie made something on his Switch, like we could pull it up on the PS4 or on the Xbox or on the PSVR and play his creation on, on the TV as well, which which is really neat. Um, Fate Extella, the Umbral Star, is a uh, is the latest in that series. This, I believe, is a hack and slash role playing game. This yeah. game uh, has it came been out, out on PS4, yeah, in January, yeah, January. Okay, so it came out on PS4 in January, making its way over to the Switch now for. Fifty nine ninety nine. Uh, Cubics Paint is kind of a uh, design your own Minecraft type of a uh, type of a game. That's four ninety nine on the Switch this week. Ultra Hyperball is a ten dollar title. I'm honestly not sure what this is. I was trying to make heads or tails of what the game is. It looks like that game you play as a kid where you just try and keep the balloon up in the air and stop it from hitting the ground. <laughs> like that. That looks like what's going on here. There's like a ball that's bouncing off your head that you're trying to keep bouncing. Um, and then Namco Museum is a Friday release, twenty nine ninety nine for the switch which seems like quite a bit for like galaga and big dug and and pac-man like on this collection but uh, i don't know maybe that's the going rate for the namco museum uh the wii u nothing to report this week the 3ds uh we missed last week mononoke forest is on there for four bucks quite a few titles coming to the 3ds this week uh actually first before we get to that i want to mention the new 2ds xl will be available this friday 
um, alongside some of the other games that are coming out this week. So if you're at all interested in that platform and some of the changes it makes to the 2DS, 3DS formula, you know, be on the lookout for that. It retails for 150 so 50 bucks cheaper than the 3DS XL. So if you're not interested in 3D, maybe you hop in there for a decent price and get into this ecosystem. Frankie, you still uh, thinking about this at all? Yeah, I'm still, still kicking it around. It's a good yeah. possibility. Good possibility. Not this week, but... Maybe. Maybe in the future. Yeah. Cool. Bender, you uh, you upgrading to a 2DS XL? This would be, what, your seventh 3DS now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy with my... Uh... <laughs> Majora's Mask Edition 3DS XL. Ah, oh, yeah. We'll have to pry that from your cold, dead hands, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, coming to the 3DS this week in terms of games, we got, uh, hey, Pikmin. It's a Friday release, July 28th. It'll be on there for $40. Bender, what's what's the deal with this, man? It's a side-scrolling Pikmin game. Um, does it still retain like the strategy elements? Like, What are you, what are you doing in this game? Are you interested in this at all? Uh, it's sort of interested. Uh, from what I hear, it's, it, I mean, it's not, it doesn't play like a Pikmin game at all. There, it doesn't have any of the, uh, strategy elements to it. It's more of just a side scrolling, like, like light puzzle solving type of thing where you're just commanding your Pikmin to carry things from one place to another or build bridges or stuff like that. Hmm. Um, and you throw them at enemies just like in the regular Pikmin games, but um, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm going to try out. There, there is a demo for it on 3DS, which I still need to download and play and tr- check it out and decide if it's something I want to play more of. Um, I might, it might be just be something that I rent and play through and then return and mm-hmm. move on, uh, if, if I like it enough, but, uh, it's not something I'm like itching to run out and buy or anything, but it, yeah, you know, I like the P- Pikmin franchise, so it might keep my interest enough. I'm not sure. That amiibo though, <laughs> that amiibo is cool. I like it a lot. <laughs> so you think this could be a case of them just kind of slapping the Pikmin branding on something that didn't necessarily need it, just to you know maybe get some more sales behind it or whatever? Could be, yeah, yeah. Kind of like that Chibi Robo game that yeah. turned out to be not that great. <laughs> <laughs> Open up old, old or whatever. Ones. <laughs> yeah, Whiplash, Ziplash. Yeah, had that really cool amiibo. I still have that amiibo, but I don't don't think I have that game anymore. I think I traded it in. <laughs> I have that amiibo. It's a cool amiibo. Yeah, it's nice. Nice. Uh, also coming to the 3DS is we is a game that's been talked about for a little while about Metopia. So the the me kind of the crazy me RPG is also coming out on Friday. What's what's the deal on this one, Bender? Any any interest in this one? Uh, again, there's a demo for this one as well, which I st- still haven't tried, but, um, I'll, I'll check it out. I, I don't know exactly what it is. I think it's just more kind of like a RPG type thing where you just take, take your me characters through and just fight enemies and turn based <laughs> battles and stuff. It's se- seems like it's, sounds like it's a lot like the, um, one of the street pass games is called find yes. me where you go through and, and fight enemies and stuff and you recruit your me's to go and, and battle for you. Um, so it seems like a, a little, like a deeper version of that. So if that's the case, I, I, I might, I, I might like it. I, I like that mini game. So it seems like it could be something that's interesting. Find me is cool. I like that one. Yeah. That's <laughs> one of my favorite street pass games. Sweet. Uh, so that's Metopia, And then, uh, swipe is an eShop title, dollar 49. So puzzle game about avoiding a black dot or something so that's available <laughs> that's available on thursday Brent, that's I'm, it man i'm gonna guess that elder scrolls legends is coming to phones this week because pete hines said by the end of the month and that's pretty much this week right this is it <sighs> hopefully we'll see i don't know the 30 how many days are in july 31 yep so we still got monday <laughs> are you uh are, are you that excited for this game frankie yeah, actually, I, I am. I uh, really, I, I check every day to see if it's live because I actually really want to play this game. I've watched a couple streams and it looks mm-hmm. ridiculously complicated, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I also feel like if I'm actually playing it and kind of understanding what I'm doing, it's probably going to be a cool way to pass the day. So that's where my interest lies with it. All right. Well, that was the new releases. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. So we're going to take a quick break. We've got some music here from Ruel Ethan. We'll be right back. Thank you. 
And welcome back. Thanks again to Ruel Ethan for producing the music for the podcast. He does the opening, the closing, the music you just heard right there. Very talented young man. Follow him on Twitter, at Ruel Ethan. Check out his music on SoundCloud and iTunes. Thanks again, man. We really appreciate your efforts. All right, guys, let's jump into the news. It's it's Comic-Con. Comic-Con is going on right now, and there's been a ton of news coming out. I mean, we were talking movie trailers, but we also got to hear from Telltale Games. And wow, they came out swinging with some big, <laughs> big news this week. First up, Batman gets season two, and it launches next month. Episode one, The yeah. Enigma, premieres August 8th on Xbox One, PS4, PC, Mac, and uh, a little bit later on mobile. In this latest chapter, both Bruce Wayne and Batman will be forced into precarious new roles. The Riddler has returned to terrorize Gotham City, but his gruesome puzzles merely foreshadow an even greater crisis. With the arrival of a ruthless federal agent and the return of a still nascent Joker, Batman must navigate uneasy alliances while Bruce Wayne undertakes a perilous series of deceptions. Man, now when did the last episode of this come out? December, right? December? Was it December? Yeah, I think so. Was that a late November, early December? That's a quick turnaround to get season two here, August 8th. Are they actually calling this season two? Because I think it was just Batman Enemy Within or something like that. Oh, I'm not sure. I just know. Oh, I guess I should have said this is Batman gets a second season. Um, but uh, yeah, this uh, this comes out August 8th. Bender, you uh, you excited for this, man? Yeah, definitely. Um, I really, really enjoyed the first the first uh, season. Um, s- super cool. Ended on a cliffhanger and had a lot of cool twists and turns throughout the plot. They did some some really cool, unique things with the with the Batman lore that I that I really enjoyed. And um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to this a lot. Um, I think it's gonna be uh, really really cool. Mm-hmm. Now, boys, as a Batman super fan, I'm assuming you played through all of uh, season one. I wish, man. It's cool. one that uh, when that slipped through the cracks on me. I really love the Riddler. He's one of my favorite Batman villains, so it's it's cool that he's he's in this in this first episode here. So I, I wish I could hop in there. I still need to play through the first season. Obviously, that's not going to happen before the second season comes out. Don't know when that's going to happen. So <laughs> eventually, eventually, hopefully, I'll play through this story, but not in the cards right now. Right, I feel you on that, Franklin. Yeah, I'm excited. I really uh, with Bender. I really like the first season a whole lot. Um, is it Troy Baker they have voicing Batman? Mm-hmm. He's, he's awesome. I love Troy Baker. So, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, the writing in the first one was awesome. And like Bender said, it was really cool seeing what they did with the Batman lore. Um, at least the parts of it that I know and understand, mm-hmm. uh, sort of seeing what they did with a lot of those characters and kind of, you know, putting their own unique twists on them. It was awesome. So I can't wait to play more Batman. That's another series they've done that I, uh, really excited to see where they take it from, uh, from the first season. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I only uh, it's it's like a lot of these Telltale games. I played through the first episode, and just got lost uh, lost along the way. So really enjoyed episode one. Still haven't played the rest. Bender gives me the disappointment face. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> It'll take you like two hours to go through the whole you thing. You need to just... direct that disappointment face at voice. <sighs> That's hey, like I said, man. Oh. I don't claim to be a huge <laughs> Batman fan, so <clears throat> it is what it is. <laughs> Both of you, just oh. take, just sit down at night. Just take, just go through all five episodes. Won't take that long. Must be, it must be nice being a bachelor. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Bender's like, just sit down and play it for five hours. It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> just ignore the crying baby. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got uh, Batman. The second season begins August eighth. Uh, also coming out of Comic Con, Telltale confirmed the Walking Dead season four will be the final season of the Walking Dead series. Season four will once again star Clementine and and, and called it the final season of the series. Voice actress Melissa Hutchinson will return to reprise her role as Clementine. So far, Telltale has confirmed the final season for The Walking Dead will be released on consoles, PC, Mac, iOS, and Android. So basically everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, Clementine will be back for the fourth and final season of The Walking Dead. I haven't played that since the first three episodes of Walking Dead season two. So I'm not even sure what's gone on since then, but uh, it's cool to see them actually bringing this one to a close so they can focus on some of the uh, the other series, including The Wolf Among Us Season 2, announced yeah. for 2018, Frankie. Uh, Telltale Finally. confirmed that actors Aaron Yvette 
and Adam Harrington will return as Snow and Bigby and referred to season two as a new story, a new mystery, and an all new set of stakes. Franklin, your thoughts on The Wolf Among Us season two? Season one of The Wolf Among Us is probably my favorite Telltale series to date. Mm. And that's coming off of like season one of The Walking Dead and Tales from the Borderlands. Uh, I'm excited. I honestly did figure this was one they're just going to kind of leave behind. Uh, I know it's maybe one of the more lesser known uh, franchises that they're working with because I certainly have never heard of Fables prior to playing Wolf Among Us. Mm-hmm. Um, but the writing was amazing. Um, the story they told throughout the first season was really cool. Um, kind of kept me guessing the whole way through. Um, I want to see how if they do pull over like any decisions you made in the first game because there was a lot of stuff that uh, like when you finish that game like you're at a certain standing with um, the community because essentially Bigby Wolf is I don't want to say like the mayor but he's kind of like this um, head figure for the com- for the Fable community mm-hmm. so or for Fable Town rather but um, yeah so I want to see like if they actually kind of bring any of that into this game or if they just kind of write it off and start a new also fine with that obviously they can uh, they can tell some really cool stories in that universe so mm-hmm. really really excited I, I actually am probably going to play those as they release hopefully this time around it's not like the first time with the wolf among us where it was three or four months between episodes because that mm-hmm. really sucked but yeah if you guys haven't played the wolf among us season one i highly recommend that one it's it's incredible yeah, and you mentioned the delay between the episodes, and that was actually the, 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 the final blow for me actually finishing that one, which pissed me off because episode one was so freaking good. I played through episode one, I was like, man, this is fantastic. And then after like three months, you know, and just like any of these episodic games, and you're waiting two or three months, you, you kind of lose interest, and then you're like, I don't remember what the hell happened in the last episode. I got, do I got to go back and play this? You know, and then you're like, oh, I'll just wait for the all of them to come out a year later. I'm not going back to that, but. You know, now that we've got a season two here, I, I do want to go back and check that out because seriously, episode one of, of The Wolf Among Us was probably my favorite episode of all Telltale games. I mean, I really absolutely loved it. I thought this was awesome. But, you know, when you have, a, you know, three to four months between episodes and you got a bunch of other games coming out, it's real easy to lose tracks of some of these episodic games. Uh, so I'm definitely yeah. curious and in, in, in playing through this finally and, and, and seeing what this is all about because I absolutely love the first episode. I, I might be wrong in my timeline, but I think with season one, like episode one came out in November. Episode two didn't surface until like the end of March. Mm-hmm. So I think you're right. I do. It was it was a prolonged time. It, yeah, I was like, it this, was this ridiculous. sucks. Yeah. So mm. the other thing with, with these Telltale games, and I think even um, what's one they have running now? Like um, Guardians? Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, like that one started in April. We're getting in August now, so that's four months. And I think episode three is just now coming out. So they're not sticking to the episode a month. No, they're not. We no. saw them start. So that's another one that I'm going to wait. And the other thing that really makes me mad about these games is as they're going, like as the season's progressing, like the season pass is going on sale for a lot cheaper than it was when you initially bought it. Yep. So that's been really frustrating because I know with Wolf Among Us, especially like in that span like that November to March mm-hmm. the game was on sale for like the season passes, 24 bucks. It was down to like 10 bucks at one point in there. Right. I was pissed. That was, that was when I kind of was like, I'm done with these season passes. It's done. <laughs> Just going to wait. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, as you alluded to uh, guardians of the galaxy episode three has gotten a release date. Uh, it'll be released on, on August 22nd. The episode will be called more than a feeling. The story details about the new episode are scarce, but there will be a strong focus on Gamora according to Marvel's Ryan Panegos on Twitter. So we don't know much about it other than it'll focus a lot on Gamora, and it's titled More Than a Feeling, out August 22nd. So lots and lots of good stuff from Telltale Games. I mean, a lot of great stuff. I think, for me, The Wolf Among Us Season 2 is a standout. Obviously, I know you guys are excited about Batman. i got to play through it to find out just how good that is. But uh, The Wolf Among Us Season 2 is definitely the highlight for me. Frankie, you? Oh yeah, totally. I uh, I cannot wait for Wolf Among Us. Uh, really excited about Batman, but I have gun to head, man. Wolf Among Us is the one that I, I I'm gonna hop into as soon as possible. Ben, would you say Batman's probably the one that you're pissed that you you haven't played through? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, love Batman. I have a long history with the character. I've never actually played through a, a series of a, a season of a Telltale game, <laughs> so mm-hmm. I re- I. Haven't played through a single one, not even the Walking Dead season one. So, mm-hmm. uh, 
So I don't really have any connection to any of these, but I, I would like to play through Batman. Hmm, He's I got too a, good for those platinum trophies. <laughs> I was going to say, I got a, I got a platinum <laughs> you don't. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, Bender, highlight for you out of all these Telltale games. Um, probably Batman for me. I, mm-hmm. I do want to check out The Wolf Among Us, but I don't know enough about it to be excited about it. But um, uh, and I, I do want to get back to get to get into the Guardians thing, but I'm kind of waiting until they're all out because, mm-hmm. like Frankie mm-hmm. said, I mean they're not sticking to a schedule, so I don't want to start the first three episodes and then not know when the four, fourth and fifth ones are coming out. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna Probably wait on that one after September sixth. So, <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I should, maybe I should, maybe I should play them before then, because I may never play any of them. <laughs> I don't awesome. Know, so, yeah. So, so, yeah, that's your uh, telltale moment. Now we got to kill this entire podcast. Uh, boys, <laughs> let's jump into some fighting game news, buddy. Let's do it, man. So, coming off of Evo, it was a huge week for fighting games. Tons of fighting game stuff to talk about, so. Um, a lot of this stuff came out of the final day of Evo, which was on Sunday. We record our podcast on Saturday. So a lot of this stuff came just on the tail end of, of when we released the last show. But first and foremost, Franklin, we're going to start with Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. So um, not only did we get Jetta revealed at um, at Evo from Darkstalkers, who's a, an awesome character that a lot of people love. A lot of people were hoping Jetta was going to be a part of, of Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Jetta's in there. We also got confirmation that Gamora was going to be in there alongside Thanos as a playable character. So we know Thanos was going to be an integral part of the Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite storyline. We saw him in the story demo that was released for the game. We now know he's going to be in there as a playable character as well. So the big baddie of the Marvel Universe himself will be in there as a playable character. And then this week, this weekend at Comic-Con, they unveiled four new characters for Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. You saw Frank West, Nemesis, Hagar, and Spider-Man. All confirmed for Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. These are all characters that were in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Three, uh, all, all of these characters were actually very popular characters. If you watched Evo, you saw these guys on many of the teams that were competing throughout that tournament. And we saw a trailer released at Comic-Con that had all, all of these characters and, and what they looked like in action and... Looks looks really badass. Frank, Nemesis, Hagar, and Spider Man look to play very similarly to the way they did in, in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom three. There's a few new moves in there though. We saw Spider Man's uh, really really awesome level three, where he takes the he kind of dodges uh, Green Goblin's pumpkin bombs, webs them up, throws them at the enemy. That's a sweet uh, <laughs> super move. Uh, it's it's really really cool to watch that one in action. So. There's going to be a few new moves, a few new tactics in there as well. We saw the Mind Stone in play as well, which is going to be an interesting way to set up combos. That's one of the really interesting things about Infinite is the way they're going to use the the gems and the way that that's going to factor into the gameplay. Uh, Frankie, what do you think about what we saw from Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, man? So I didn't see the new trailer for the new characters yet, but um, I did see uh, at Evo, I think it was right after the um, Ultimate Marvel Mm-hmm. Uh, tournament the final the time of the finals yeah but uh yeah they uh they pulled in Gamora so they showed her I think she was fighting uh Captain Marvel mm-hmm. so she's beating the crap out of her and then uh Jetta came in during that match that was like the big reveal at <laughs> Evo yeah but th- that game just looks so ah uh, like a polished Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom three it just looks so nice in action so yeah uh, but yeah I can't I can't wait to get in there and play that game man that's uh one of the things in September I really want to want to hit on um just because I want to play through that story it sounds mm-hmm. awesome but yeah, yeah this, is, this is awesome yeah Gamora Gamora looks awesome she looks like she plays similar to like a like a Virgil or a Dante she has uh she has a gun she has a sword and she has a lot of really fast-paced hard-hitting combos that she mm-hmm. combos out of from that and uh yeah she looks like she's gonna be a really really fun character to use so, uh, yeah, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite shaping up very well. Man, we're, we're not too far away from this game. This game actually comes out uh, a couple, couple weeks after Destiny. So, um, man, it's going to be a busy, busy fall. Uh, so good stuff out of Infinite. Let's move on to the other comic book game, and that's Injustice 2. <laughs> How about this, dude? So Black Manta leaked via the Xbox dashboard. <laughs> or, or there's like a picture on there that says, what, what does it say? Black Manta? Yeah, it's uh, fight, play fight. as Black Manta... Yeah. Now, yeah. now, mind you, Black Manta hasn't been revealed or even 
even talked about in any way, shape, or form, but it's on the Xbox marketplace. You know, <laughs> the, the, just like advertising the character. So we all we all we all knew Black Mana was gonna be in this game. His silhouette was is very distinguishable. He has a very odd shape. So you just look at his silhouette in that picture that they first unveiled when Injustice Two first came out in terms of the uh the DLC characters that were in Shadow. It was clear that Black Mana was gonna be a part of this game, so this is not like film at eleven. But it was just funny that it was on the Xbox Live Marketplace, and I think it's pretty clear that Black Manta is going to be a part of the second pack of characters that are going to be coming to this game. We don't know when, though. Haven't had any official announcement on that. What we did get officially in, uh, not announced, but we officially saw Starfire at Comic-Con this past weekend. Starfire looks awesome in Injustice 2. This is the final character in the first DLC pack, the first of three DLC packs. We saw her doing, uh, she looks like she's got some some very, very powerful moves. A lot of different techniques to use as a character. Ranged mm-hmm. versus close quarters. She has her uh, like laser blast that she can utilize. She can fly around the screen. Her super move is awesome. Takes you up into space yeah. and just blows you up. So, uh, yeah, she looks like she's got some really, really cool techniques. Also in there, in that trailer, you saw her at one point fighting Bizarro. So um, it looks like Bizarro is going to be unveiled as one of the premier skins. So these are like those those skin packs that you get for characters that basically transform them into other characters in the DC universe. So for instance, Supergirl has a skin that turns her into Power Girl. You know, it's it's basically like a palette swap, and she'll do the same moves as Supergirl, but you can play it as the Power Girl character. Uh, Flash has like the Reverse Flash you can play as. So they do cool stuff like that, and it looks like. Uh, from what we can tell, you know, Bizarro looked like a, a palette swap for Superman in there. But the one cool thing that they did have was the reversal of the heat and the and the ice breath. So Bizarro has has ice eyes and heat breath. So the opposite <laughs> of Superman. So they have that they have that in there as, as the palette swap, which I thought was awesome. Uh, Frankie, what do you, you think of what you, what we saw from Injustice Two here, man? Awesome. Yeah, she looks. Um very hard to uh master for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so, but i think she's coming in august but yeah like she looks badass um mm-hmm. as far as um like black manta i like you i'm not surprised that he's coming to the game um i thought i read somewhere too that he's in one of the stage transitions and they actually oh, recently yeah i think he's in the re- atlantis stage transition yeah apparently they redesigned him in there in the stage transition oh really yeah, so I don't know if that's like indicative of how his final like character is going to look when he's in the game, hmm. but that's I, I gotta get in there and check that out. But I can, I gotta get into this game soon. <laughs> like it pisses me off every time I see these trailers, all these new characters. I bought the, the ultimate edition. Um, I had to do like you know the standard game, and I bought the pass for it. But mm-hmm. God, every time I see these trailers and you know watching Evo, I'm sitting here just like I need to get in here and play this game. It just looks so awesome. And yeah. like I now like I have all these characters like I can't wait to get in there and try out Sub Zero, mm-hmm. um, you know we saw uh, Sonic Fox just going crazy with Red Hood at Evo, and of yep. course the second you mention anything he starts getting <laughs> shut down left and right. But uh, <laughs> the 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 announcer's curse coming coming through Twitter, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But I mean like watching like the Flash and um actually one of the people I follow on Twitter um. He's like obsessed with this game, like the multiverse. So he's getting all his characters up to level twenty, getting all this different gear for him, mm-hmm. and just like listening to him talk about the game, I'm like, this sounds like so much fun. I want to get in here and play this game, but I just I can't find the time, and it sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a game game that obviously requires a lot of a lot of time and attention. You know, a lot a lot goes into becoming well versed at at the different characters that are in the game. I'm I'm in the same boat as you, man. Something I you know, have not spent nearly enough time with since I have, since I've got the game. So I really do want to get in there and, and learn the ins and outs of this and get into the multiverse, which everybody loves and everybody is always talking about. So yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm like on the outside of the party looking in when it comes to the multiverse. So I definitely need yeah. to need to fix that as well. But uh, yeah, justice too lo- looks great. And uh, I sooner rather than later, I'm sure we'll see the, the next round of DLC characters unveiled. You know that Ed, that Ed Boon's a slippery fella, so you gotta get it, gotta keep your eye on him. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of uh, like people in the background, you know, one one of the things that's in in the background of Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite as well in the stage that they showed is Modok, who is a uh, a very very interesting character in Ultimate Marvel Three. He's actually really cool to watch. People that know how to play Modok in that game, 
and some of the stuff that they do with him, who's a character that never in a million years you would be like, yeah, this is going to be a sweet guy for a fighting game. But uh, is he like that big floating? Yeah, big head. Face? Yeah. yeah, he's like that big head. He works with AIM. You know, he's an Iron Man villain primarily. Um, he works. <clears throat> he works with works with advanced idea mechanics. He gets involved with Hydra and stuff like that as well. So he's kind of in that corner of the universe. But yeah, he was awesome in Ultimate Three. To watch some of the the Evo pros play with Modok is really really cool. So he's in the background. It looks like people are working on him. Um, in in one of the stages, so maybe we'll see Modok as as a DLC character sometime down the line. I think that would be cool. <clears throat> but I digress. So speaking of speaking of badasses, how about Geese Howard arriving as the next character for Tekken Seven? And Franklin, I don't know if you watched the trailer for Geese, but he retains some of his like classic like uh, like Fatal Fury moves in Tekken Seven. And just like Akuma looks like a badass in Tekken Seven, Geese looks like a badass in Tekken 7. His moves and his combos look really, really awesome, really hard-hitting. He retains some of his projectile attacks. His, like, super move that he does, where he uh, where the screen turns black and, the, and the, the Japanese characters go up behind him, you know, something similar to, like, the Raging Demon, is just totally awesome. Uh, what do you think of Geese, dude? Like you said, looks like a total badass. Uh, they, they actually uh, did the reveal for him right after the uh, Tekken 7 tournament. So yeah. this is another one that I got to catch live, and I was—I actually recognized him when he mm-hmm. popped up. I was like, "No, they're not going to bring him in here." <laughs> so that—that that was really cool to see. But yeah, he just gets in there and uh, totally destroys everyone. So yeah, uh, looks like he's going to be a total badass. Can't wait to get in there and try him out. I think it's cool that they have these guest characters in Tekken Seven, so they're bringing yeah. in like you know stuff like Akuma, like Geese. I wonder who else uh, Harada might go out there and try and try and bring in the Tekken. Who else? Who else would you like to see in there? If you had, um, if you had your way, <laughs> stupidly, probably a Smash Brothers character. <laughs> <laughs> Go out there and get Bayonetta in there or something. Yeah, actually, that'd be kind of cool. Or bring Shovel Knight in since Nintendo won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shovel Knight in, in Tekken Seven, man. That that'd be the day. Um, yeah. So so geese looking good. Um, but how about this one, dude? So we saw this from uh, how do you say this company? Is it Arika? I think so. I'm going to go with Arika. But Arika, the company behind the Street Fighter EX series, the much beloved Street Fighter EX series, they have a successor coming out. And this was... Because I didn't, I didn't I guess I missed this, but apparently this was an April Fool's joke earlier this year where they, mm-hmm. where they, yeah. where they unveiled something similar to this. But at Evo, they come out with this game and they, they've got these crazy looking characters like the Skullamania dude. Um, and they they come out with this... You know that they're making a spiritual successor to the Street Fighter EX series. Uh, Franklin, what do you what do you make of this game, dude? No idea. <laughs> I actually <laughs> didn't didn't watch it. I saw all the okay. stuff about it afterwards, but I uh, I missed the Street Fighter tournament altogether, so yeah. I don't know where this came from. I don't know if this was like an after the fact thing, but yeah, yeah, I don't remember when it was exactly announced. Um, they had some panels at at Evo as well, so I don't know when they were announcing this stuff, but. Uh, um, if you missed Evo, check it out on our website. We have the page up archive now. Um, shameless plug. But uh, yeah, but if, if you're a fan of Street Fighter EX, be on the lookout for this game. Sounds like this thing is is has a beta plan for the end of this year on the PS4. So we're going to get to see what this is all about sooner rather than later. Um, the hits keep coming from there on the Blaze Blue side of things. So not only did they announce Jubei as a new character, who's this cool like cat samurai dude. But they announced this new game, this uh, Blaze Blue Cross. Um, what's the name? What's the name of this game? Blaze Blue Cross something. Cross Tag Battle. That's what it's called. Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle. So they have a brand new Blaze Blue tag fighting game. So Blaze Blue Arc System Works makes these crazy, beautiful two D fighting games with all this stuff going on the screen in a in a regular one v one match. So now when you throw tag battling in here. We're gonna have dudes flying all over the screen with all types of <laughs> all types of wacky moves and and special attacks going on, uh, and and so this is gonna house um, not only Blaze Blue, of course, but it's gonna have some other anime franchises in there as well. So we're gonna have uh, the Persona Four Arena, like the the Ultimax characters are gonna be in there as well as part of this. Uh, the RWBY that I'm not sure how to say that, but that franchise is gonna be in there. As well as the characters from um, 
under <laughs> what's the name of this thing? Under Night in Birth. Oh yeah. EXE yeah. late whatever the hell the name of that yeah. game is. The <laughs> the under the under night group is gonna be inside of this game as well. So we got these these four crazy anime franchises all coming together in a blaze blue tag battle. Um, Frankie, what do you what do you think of of this man? What do you think about this development? Uh, I'm actually pretty excited about this. Um, I gotta ask one of my buddies because I have uh, I have two friends who are actually really into that RWBY thing. I don't really okay. I should ask them about it because I don't. I they keep talking about it. and I don't understand what it is. So I should really, you know, hop into a conversation with them about that. But uh, yeah, I can't wait, dude. I I love those that team. Um, Arc System Works makes some really gorgeous fighting games. So kind of seeing them you know kind of get to the next level bringing some some tag team fighting Mm -hmm. i can't wait that's gonna be awesome yeah definitely um there's a there's a new patch out for central fiction now as well and uh interesting comments from from uh from from the blaze blue team on the possibility of, of games coming over to the switch so toshi michi mori toshi michi mori who's uh the creator of blaze blue uh, he was speaking about about the possibility of of games coming to the Switch, more specifically Blaze Blue, and it 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 sounds like you know Blaze Blue was actually one of the games they showed on that uh, that kind of third party graphic for the Switch as games that were you know yeah. either in development or or planned for the system in the future. So you know when they asked him about Blaze Blue coming over to the platform, he said he can't say any more about it today, but he was you know encouraged by seeing things like Arms on Nintendo's console and hoping that something, you know, some fighting game community can shape up around, around the switch. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see where that goes from there. But I think at some point blaze blue is going to make its way over to the Nintendo switch. Just make sure you have a pro controller or a stick or something. Joy cons ain't cutting it for the fighting games. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of arc system works, dragon ball fighters, is there a more anticipated fighting game on the planet than Dragon Ball Fighters? Probably not. But Trunks revealed for Dragon Ball Fighters this week. Krillin revealed for Dragon Ball Fighters this week. And the the granddaddy of them all, Piccolo himself, has been confirmed Ooh. for Dragon Ball Fighters, which we all we all knew he was gonna be in there. I mean, these are not like surprise characters or anything. But uh there's a closed beta sign up that begins on July twenty sixth. So as much as I get tired of these betas, I'm probably gonna sign up for this one. So I want to play this game because God damn it, it looks beautiful. Um, <laughs> but uh, so we saw some, some gameplay from Trunks. We saw some stuff from, from Krillin and Piccolo. We saw the new replay mode they're talking about, which sounds pretty cool, where you can you know uh, replay matches, check things out, kind of analyze your your wins and losses. Um, Frankie, talk to me about Dragon Ball Fighters, man. Yeah, like you, I'm really excited about this game. The, the fact that it looks just like the show within a fighting game like i i know that arc system works is really like nailed down that style and obviously guilty gear and blaze blue look awesome and they're essentially anime style fighting games but this literally does look like watching an episode of dragon ball z just yeah. f- unfolding and uh this is another one i think they uh showed the trunks trailer after the um blaze blue tournament mm-hmm. um so yeah that was really cool to see live um you know i texted one of my other friends who's a big dragon ball fan uh, he's a huge Trunks fan, so I was like, "Dude, Trunks is in this game. We need we need to get this. And we need to play it when it comes out." So <laughs> I'm trying to find, you know, like a group of friends around me who are into fighting games. I have a couple, um, but you know, we don't really get together all that often, so it's really few and far between. But I would really like to, you know, kind of get back to having some friends over for you know, whether it be Smash or when Dragon Ball comes out. Dragon Ball would probably be an easier sell because I have several friends who are huge Dragon Ball fans. So um, yeah, I'm excited, dude. That game just looks phenomenal, and like you. Um, definitely going to be signing up to uh, try out that beta hopefully mm-hmm. you know i better luck this time around because i think they did a beta for um i want to say it was for guilty gear maybe maybe it was last blaze blue but i remember they had a closed beta for one of their later uh latest releases and uh didn't have any luck getting in so yeah i think i think it i think it was guilty gear guilty gear zerd one of those had a had a beta for it yeah um yeah so can't wait for that one and and let me just let me just repeat this just so everybody is clear but piccolo is a fighter in Dragon Ball Fighters. He's confirmed. You can play as Piccolo. You can do like special beam cannons, whatever, all, all that stuff. Stretch, so stretch the arms. Yeah, I can be Piccolo playing as Piccolo in Dragon Ball Fighters. That's freaking exciting. So <laughs> can't wait, can't wait to get my hands on Piccolo. Um, Dragon Ball Fighters looks just incredible. And then 
Arc System. How many people work at Arc System Works? <laughs> they they are they are developing no less than like four fighting games at the same time. But they have Under Night In Birth X Late ST. Um, that's probably going to be the name of this game when it comes over west as well. Unfortunately, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to learn how to say this thing. But Under Night In Birth is is confirmed for the west. It just released in Japan recently, and it's coming out later this year in the west. Frankie, this is another Arc System Works crazy beautiful 2d fighting game with with wild special attacks and super moves like where are they finding the people to develop these games <laughs> how in the hell do they have four fighting games that they're making at the same time these are good looking questions <laughs> i mean seriously are they in like a tower in tokyo with with multiple floors just full of fighting game developers like where are they finding these people they could be it's a- it is, it's a good question because I know um, they have a couple different publishers they're working with. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Namco is obviously publishing Dragon Ball, but uh, yep. Axis is publishing Undernight when it comes over mm-hmm. here. Yeah, um, I actually got to see a little bit of this game. It looks this is another one that looks really awesome. So mm-hmm. um, I think the last one they were on the PS3 that was free not too long ago, right? Yeah, it was on so, a, on a PlayStation Plus. Yeah, so I, I have that in my library for when I acquire another PS3. But yeah, I. I like I've said many times so far, like this year has just been freaking awesome as a fighting game fan. So oh, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I can't wait to check this out when it comes over here. Yeah. Couldn't couldn't ask for any more as a as a fighting game fan. But my gosh, when you're making Blaze Blue, Guilty Gear, Dragon Ball <laughs> Fighters, and Undernight, you're making them all basically simultaneously. That's nuts, man. So uh hats off to Arc System works. Not only are they making these games, but they're making these games like really good and really cool and fans are enjoying them and people are getting in there and they've got these robust fighting mechanics. It's uh it's it's really impressive. And they all look absolutely drop dead gorgeous. I mean they're just the pinnacle of two D animation in these games. It's uh it's it's pretty wild. Um a couple more things we want to mention here on the fighting game circuit. Square Enix has a closed beta for Final Fantasy Final Fantasy Dissidia NT which is, uh, I think, going on right now. I signed up for it, didn't get the invite, so that's unfortunate. But, that's a uh, fighting game? Yeah. <laughs> so, so they've got, uh, I think it's like a uh, like a Power Stone-style fighting game, maybe. These big like arenas, but I, I could be mistaken on that. I'll have to go back and, and watch the, the trailer for it. But yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fighting game. Um, Wave Dash games, which are known for the Super Smash Brothers Brawl mod, uh, they're actually branched off and they're making their own game now with icons, combat arena. And guess what? It's a Smash Brothers it, game. Yeah, so. it literally looks exactly like Smash Brothers. I thought this was a trailer for Brawlhalla at first when <laughs> they started playing. Yeah. Well, game game looks cool, man. I mean, they're they're putting a lot of the Smash Brothers mechanics into here, and it's going to be a game that uh, you know you'll be able to play on other platforms. So, really excited to see where that one goes. And one final nugget here, Evo Japan announced for January. They've been talking about this for a while. It's official now. January 26th through the 28th, we'll have the Japanese version of Evo rear its head for the first time. Excited to to sit down and watch that. Brent, that is going to end our, our very, very long fighting game news section. There's so much good stuff going on right now, man. It's a great time to be a fighting game fan. You excited, buddy? Yeah, Brent. Uh, you excited? I don't think... I don't think I've ever been more excited to get to the <laughs> Nintendo news section than I am right now. Are you playing ARMS fan. right now? <laughs> I, I wish I was. I wish I was. Yeah, uh, uh, an- Another game he's not interested in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get into some Nintendo news. Uh, first up, the Nintendo Switch Online app is available now, <laughs> and it's yeah, an it absolute disaster. I mean, it really is. This thing... Just just to give you the, an idea of how, how how anti-consumer and how stupid this is, when you launch this app on your phone and you go through all the painstaking setting up of a, of a lobby for your friends in Splatoon 2, which is the only game this will work with, you have to keep your phone on in the app at all times. If your phone goes, like, goes dark or auto, uh, what's that called when it... Shuts not shuts like off. Sleep but sleep mode. Yeah, guys, it goes into sleep mode. Can't talk. If you close the app, can't talk. What if I text you? Can't talk. <laughs> what if I get a phone call? Can't talk. What if you get a Twitter notification? Can't talk. <laughs> you have to keep this thing open. Oh, and not to mention, it's a battery hog when you do. Ah, so don't shocking. use it on iPhone. <laughs> don't use it anywhere. This thing is just. <laughs> 
it's 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 literally our worst nightmare, you guys. I mean, it really is. This this again, this is what we use in 2017 to game on a Nintendo Switch. Where if I fire up my PlayStation Vita, the most the worst mobile handheld ever with no games from 2012. I can just plug a headphone into the into the Vita and set up a party chat and talk to my friends. Hey Brent, if you're playing Splatoon 2 on your TV and you're in party chat, can you hear game audio? Nope, sure can't. <laughs> yeah, what what's their solution? You you put one phone in in your ear and, yeah. and one phone out. <laughs> yeah, because I like playing my games with mono. Like is this that, that's, is this seriously what we're talking about right now? This is it, dude. This is what what what, what Reggie say this the, this was this was ideal. Or this was uh, innovative for for gamers. This is unreal, man. This is a f-ing travesty. It's what yeah. this is. This is. Hey, let's 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 go to the mail. Let's go to the Nintendo correspondent. <laughs> let's get his thoughts. Bender, I know you're itching to talk about this. Talk about this awesome Nintendo Online app, dude. Um, I haven't tried it because I don't have Splatoon two, but. From everything I've sound, I've heard, it just sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> and this is exactly what we all were fearing, and what we what we we talked about this, you know, several episodes ago when when we first heard about this this app and this mobile app. Like, like, what's going to happen if I get a phone call? What's you know, what how's it going to work? And 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 yeah, like you guys said, it's our worst fears were realized. You know, it it. it it interrupts the the app and you can't chat anymore if you get a phone call and have to leave it up. That's that's another that's one thing I did not even think about as a possibility. You have to leave the app open. You can't close it out. This thing doesn't have multitasking. Yeah. You can't just shut it and keep talking. Yeah. That's that's very disappointing. So they're, they're going to have to do something else. I mean, nobody's going to use this. It's going to it's not an elegant solution. It's not a, a cool thing like Reggie tried to make it out to be. It's <laughs> it's it's just convoluted and and it just just won't work. It's not going to work. So they're going to have to do something else. They're going to have to change it somehow and make it a better solution. I don't. And correct correct me if I'm wrong. We're going to have to pay twenty dollars for this down the road, right? Yeah, yeah, for the online functionality and the voice chat and all that stuff. Plus, I mean the whatever they're classic games that you get each month that which which that part sounds cool but um but yeah is that worth twenty dollars because if I, i'm not going to use this online chat ever if this is how it's going to be is twenty dollars yeah. now all of a sudden that price seems a little high everyone's like oh 19 bucks that's <laughs> that's cheap well i can't use the online the chat portion because it's ass and yeah. now all of a sudden i'm paying twenty dollars a month for classic games now it's starting to look a little high well, it's twenty dollars a year, so whatever. The, <laughs> the biggest problem that I have with this right now is the fact that this app is literally only usable with one game. One game. You can't like. Why can't we have a party chat in Mario Kart? Is this going to support Pokemon Tournament when that comes out, or what? What other what other multiplayer um, Nintendo games are probably coming out? Smash Brothers probably. Arms. Say if that's Smash out. Brothers. Right NBA Two K. Oh, yeah, WWE. I'm assuming these will all have multiplayer portions. Yeah. Dragon Ball. Yeah. Dragon Ball. Yeah. I mean, like. <laughs> and the thing is, the thing is that the developers they're looking at this right now. Do you think they're even going to want to implement voice chat? I mean, honestly, why waste your time putting in for something like this? Mm-hmm. Brent, how did this get off the cutting room floor? Like literally, we we sat on this podcast and we're like, worst case scenario. This happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. And literally every single one of those happens happened. How, how does this get off the cutting room floor? Like, how do you sit in the development room or in the app room for this game, and you put this thing together, you're like, man, that's a damn fine app that we just put together. We're going to put this out for people to use on their Switch games. People are going to love this shit. Are you kidding me? This is the no. best solution we've ever had. I don't, it's, this, is, this is like, like, look, Nintendo's done a lot of stupid stuff. In the past, okay, they've done a lot of dumb things. They've made some bonehead decisions, and we've always said the same thing: "Hey, they're gonna they're gonna march their own beat. They're gonna do what they want." But this is to the point where it's, it's egregious and it's it's insane. Like this is just really, really, really poor, poor. This this almost makes them look arrogant, where they think this is a good idea, and Reggie goes out there and says this is innovative, and this this bent this helps gamers out. This is. Sh- 
I, I'm sorry, but this uh, and and and, I, and I'm going to be sick and tired of the Nintendo fanboys trying to make it sound like oh this is okay, this this is okay. It's Nintendo. This is oh this is. Shit. I, you got a Nintendo fanboy right here saying it's <laughs> it's not okay. <laughs> but I mean, there's going to be people out there. I mean, they've been doing it for their entire life. They they they, they, they pardon them on everything. Like oh it's, it's Nintendo. It's okay. They'll do it. This is terrible. This is absolutely... How does this Nintendo Switch not have the ability for me to plug my headphones into it and just talk? Mm-hmm. The Wii U oh. could do that. The Wii U! <laughs> this is this is literally stuff we figured out 10 years ago. So I don't know why 10 years on we're, we're at the point where we have one headphone in our ear and the other one's hanging out. And if we, pu- if we pull down the... F- notification bar on our phone it disconnects the app what what, <laughs> type of, what is going on so that's i mean th- i really don't even know what else to say about this i mean i can sit here and bitch about this all day but the fact is it's it's probably not going to change anytime soon nintendo's going to spend more time trying to update the app to make it more user friendly but the fact that i have to use my cell phone to talk to people playing on my switch especially when i'm on the go and handheld boy i'm gonna look like an sitting on the bus or sitting in public <laughs> somewhere playing a switch talking into my phone with a bunch of wires all over the place i'm gonna look like an asshole. i mean there's just the only way nintendo can make this right is to build that functionality into the switch that's the only thing they can do that's all i got that's the only thing they can do to make this right build it into the switch patch it in somehow there's no way this is it they can get this into the firmware somehow there's right. no way this is how they're going to proceed with the Switch with its multiplayer. There's absolutely no way they can do this. It's terrible. I mean, I probably wasn't going to be using it much anyways because I, like, I'm thinking about the Switch and I'm not. You know, what I mean, if I'm on the go, I'm not playing Mario Kart. Probably, I'm not playing, um, you know, like a fighting game anywhere on the go. Like, I want to do that at home on the couch with the Pro Controller. Mm-hmm. Um, and on top of that, like I don't use party chat enough as it is. Like if I'm paying the twenty bucks a year, I'm doing it because of the library of stuff we're gonna have with the you know the classic NES games. Mm-hmm. But my biggest problem right now, and honestly my biggest concern, is like if this is looking at this as their solution to a thing that had a lot of outcry behind it, as all this stuff was like you know a pre existing concern for everybody. What does this actually mean for the virtual console? Like, do you think? Like, looking at this as, like, their solution for a thing with, you know, party chat, like, do you think they're going to look at, like, the uh, virtual console and just kind of, like, whatever we get with the $20 a year, like, is that going to be their extent of the virtual console? Like, do you Um, think, I'm just looking at this, like, the way that fan feedback has come in with this thing, like, this is all the stuff we were all worried about. We're not the only ones. We can't possibly be the only people on the planet who are sitting here worrying about all of this stuff being a problem. But like just looking at the way that this is how Nintendo handled this solution for this problem, what does it actually mean for the virtual console? Disaster. I'm gonna say right now, they're gonna be like, okay, virtual console games are gonna be thirty dollars a piece. You gotta download them to your phone first, <laughs> and then transfer them over to your Switch. <laughs> oh, you have to download it through the Nintendo Online app, and then transfer it over to your Switch. It's gonna be something like that. I mean, it won't be, but that's. Uh, a, I mean, no, I, I have no it idea. Could be. What if it sounds like you have to link it to your phone and your phone will act as your external storage for all these games and you need your phone <laughs> on and on the same Wi-Fi connection as your Switch to play these games? If it was seriously something like that, my Switch would become a one-time Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, dude. One-timer. It's just, uh, it's it's just like, a how, shame. How are you that oblivious, though? Like You can't possibly be this oblivious to anyone's concerns about this stuff and think it's okay to actually release it like this and then charge people money for it. I mean, it's, you can't even take this one seriously, dude. You can't even just laugh this off and be like, oh, it's just Nintendo being Nintendo. No, this is really, really dumb. This is just <laughs> stupid. I hate saying that because it sounds just lame, but it, it, it's stupid. It's, it's just not ideal at all. And yeah. it's poorly implemented and... They're going to spend more time trying to fix the app instead of realizing that why should they have to use their phone in the first place? 
Makes me sick. All right, let's get away from that because that's just going to piss everybody off more than they already are. But anyways. Fighting games looking pretty good right about now, huh? <laughs> Actually, it was more fun talking about that than listening to you guys talk about fighting games. Just kidding. I love you guys. <laughs> uh, another thing uh, we, we saw this week is uh, could the Nintendo 64 Classic Mini console be next? Nintendo has filed trademark applications which relate to various game controllers, including one pertaining to the Nintendo 64, sparking speculation about Nintendo's potential next mini console. A thread on NeoGAF points to a series of applications filed in Europe via the European Union Intellectual Property Office on July 18th, indicating that Nintendo is looking to register trademarks for several of its past console's controllers. Some have pointed out that the line drawn, the line drawing of the SNES controller filed on the same day appears to be identical to that of the controller printed out on the top of the side of the SNES Classics packaging. That's led some to believe that the Nintendo 64 drawing will be used on a future mini console box. It's kind of a stretch, but it's interesting that they point that out. The trademarks are all covered under the same goods and services, which include telecommunication machines and apparatus, as well as a consumer video game apparatus. So what do you guys think? Is the Nintendo 64 the next classic mini franklin honestly i hope so i uh, i would buy one of those in a heartbeat just because mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. i do i love the n64 so mm-hmm. hopefully yes if golden eyes on there i don't care what else is there boys gonna be on there um i'm actually not too connected to the nintendo 64 i don't even is there even 20 games that they could find on that thing to put on this machine mm-hmm. i think so yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um i don't know at the the sixty four for me was the time when Nintendo started to go down a path where I disconnected from them. There's some great games on there like Mario sixty four, obviously, like uh, Majora's Mask and like um, the last uh, good o- Ocarina, game. Ocarina of Time, F Zero. Yeah, there's some good titles on there, but uh, like, like I said before, I'm I don't want to see any more mini consoles. I just want the goddamn virtual console <laughs> on the Switch. That's really all I want. So uh, oh my um, god, so that that would be swell. Do you remember that interview where I forget who it was from Nintendo, but they referred to these mini consoles as a form of the virtual console. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And now that this voice chat thing is a thing, like that's probably a thing. Like this is your, <laughs> this is your virtual console now. Well, I sure, I sure as hell hope not, man. <laughs> <laughs> Better any interest in a classic 64 mini? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. There's some, some great games on the N64. Um, so yeah, I I would definitely be uh, interested in that. And I was thinking though, like <laughs> if you look at the the pattern, I mean, you we they had the uh, the NES Classic Mini had thirty games for sixty bucks. The Super NES had twenty games for eighty bucks. Is the N sixty four going to be ten games for a hundred bucks or something? <laughs> <laughs> they just He's kind joking, of like, but you know, it's like, probably going to happen. Yeah, it's well, like I'm fewer gonna... fewer and fewer games were for a, like a higher price. I'm curious, like, what 20 games would you guys put on there? Yeah, Mario like 64. When I, when I think Kart back to 64. the 64, there's like 10 games I think of that would maybe go on that thing. So Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. Mm. Um, what else? Let's see. Smash Brothers is on there. F-Zero X was amazing. I think when you start getting into like the more of the third party stuff, that's gonna where it's gonna get kind of mm-hmm. messy because obviously you're not gonna have Conquer or Banjo on there. Um, yeah, Donkey Kong sixty four could be a possibility though. Possibly, yeah, that would be cool. I'd be a big fan of that. I would love to see Diddy Kong Racing, but that's probably not gonna be, nice. be on there. Uh, so Star Fox sixty four, of course. Mm-hmm. Pilot Wings is apparently pretty good. Pilot, Pilot Wings, Wings sixty four. Awesome. I liked Yoshi's Story. I like. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but Yoshi's Story would be one I would put on there. Kirby Crystal Shards. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> Gotta so, get Kirby on there. Hell oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, I know. That was like the birth of like Mario Golf and Mario Tennis. Like those would be cool to see like on there. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Those are maybe, those are both really good. Maybe Mar- some Mario parties. Yeah, not Mario Party One. <laughs> maybe it's Mario <laughs> Party Two or Three. <laughs> But yeah, Mario Party One had all those games where you had to like rotate the joystick, and people got like blisters on their hands from those mini games. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> that was horrible. 
Um, so I'm, I don't know. Maybe there's not going to be like 30 games that you would put on it, but I, I, I'm sure there's some I'm forgetting. But I'm sure there would there. I I I would think that think it's safe to say there'd be 20 good games. Oh, Golden Eye is another one that mm. a lot of people would want to have on there. Ain't gonna be on there. Probably not, but you know that would, would be, be awesome. Good. But I don't mm. think it's gonna happen. But yeah, there's it had a, had a lot of really good games on there. Killer Instinct game on then. Oh, Wave Race sixty four. Oh, yeah. Wave Race. Yeah, <laughs> that was a good one. Yep, that was a real good one. So there you have it. I mean, I'm sure it's not out of the realm of a possibility. I'm sure they'll see how they do with the SNES. Uh, show of hands, did everyone get a pre order for the classic last night? I did. I'm starting to hear rumors of the, or. or whispers of people getting cancellations so i'm worried but i mine hasn't been canceled yet but i did get one sounds like if you got in with the first 30 minutes you're okay like it sounds like it, like within the like, and we were on we were on pretty quick because i i got mine i haven't gotten a cancellation email my order's still alive so it sounds like the cancellations have gone out already um uh, because yes. there was a bunch of that earlier a bunch of that earlier was on twitter and like on a couple of websites there the, the cancellations came out in force so hopefully yeah. We're still good because mine's still my order's still alive. I think JD yeah. was a victim of that one. Oh, mm. poor JD. Yeah, yeah. I, I jumped in there like as soon as I saw a voice put it put that in the Discord <laughs> chat. I I clicked on that and I was like getting it as fast as I could. So yeah, that that was uh yeah that was I'm, clutch. <laughs> I'm still gonna keep my Amazon UK one live just mm-hmm. in case because I never yeah. got that that never got canceled. That's still live. You so. should Same you here. should keep Same that one here. anyways. I think the shells are different for those. So they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they I look would, different. I would yep. want one just to have one. And I the, the, U, the UK one has the colored buttons, which is cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wonder or, which one know, I should fun eBay. profit. Whatever. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh last bit of nintendo news kingdom hearts 3 is not considered for will not be considered for switch until after the ps4 and xbox one versions are finished um kingdom hearts 3 uh, director tetsuya nomura had this to say the nintendo switch is definitely a very interesting piece of hardware but if uh but if we lightly say oh yeah we'll be on the nintendo switch i'm sure people will come back and say but what about the ps4 and xbox one we want them out first. Don't focus on the other platforms, Nomura told IGN. So for now, we want to focus on what platforms we've already announced we're going to be releasing Kingdom Hearts 3 on. And so after, perhaps, maybe we can start thinking about other possibilities. Um, and then somebody asked them, you know, what about what's the possibility of having HD collections on Xbox One? He, he responded, just like, the, just like with the previous answer, if we were to announce yet another Kingdom Hearts 3 project, People are going to be like, hey, what's going on? So we will want to focus on releasing on the platforms that we've already announced and then take it from there. So what do you guys think? Think we'll see a Kingdom Hearts 3 on uh, Switch at some point? Not going to get my hopes up, but it would be nice if they eventually came out with it. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think they eventually will. I think Square's been... Uh, Square seems to be pretty gung-ho about getting those Japanese games on, on the Switch. I think I Am Setsuna's on there too, so... Mm-hmm. I can see him going back down the road and getting it on there, just to have it on there. Boys? Uh, no, nah, I don't see it. I mean, I am set suit is one thing. You know, it's a smaller like digital title that they can get over there. But Kingdom Hearts Three was developed for these next gen consoles for the PS4 and the Xbox One, and you know, I don't, I don't, even though it might not push either of those units to their to their brink, I just it's a lot of work to try and then bring that over to the Switch. I think for them, so I, I don't see it at this point. I think it's strange that there's no plans to like port the um the other two games, like those other two collections over to Xbox before three comes out. Because I don't think any Kingdom Heart games have ever been on like an Xbox system before. Yeah. So I feel like yeah. if you're bringing it to that whole new in theory audience, then you maybe want them to have the other games first. Yeah, that, that 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 would make sense. I mean, like you said, this is their first time with this franchise. You know, why not get that collection out? So they can experience it from the start. Because I mean, we're still a ways off with Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts Three. Mm-hmm. Got to believe somebody, you know, people will be able to play through the other ones in the collection uh, yeah. prior to the launch. So it w- it would make sense. But I mean, maybe they're just not anticipating that kind of like that type of um, interest on the Xbox One because it's a franchise that's never been over there in the first place. Yeah, I think that would have been smarter actually, is if you get those collections out first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At least make sure you have like the interest there. But right, that's a possibility too. 
is there is there maybe something with the rights of those games? Um, I mean, they originally came out on the PS2. Um, then they had the 3DS one in there as well, some of the PSP one. Mm-hmm. So I don't I don't know if any of that factors into it at all. It's a good looking question. I'm not really sure on that one. And uh, that's gonna do it for the Nintendo section, boys. Let's finish up the show with uh, some NPD news. Yeah, so we got the MPD results from uh, June and some interesting stuff in here. So let's start first with, with the software numbers. So overall, the number one game for the month of June, Tekken 7. Yeah. Um, probably bolstered by the excitement around Evo. Maybe not. Who knows? Probably. Evo's, Evo uh, was not until July. So, But yeah, could have could have been some of that around that. Obviously, everybody getting excited about fighting games. Number two, Injustice 2. Another fighting game. The top two games of, for the month of, of June were fighting games. That's awesome. At number three, All Reliable. Wow. Grand Theft Auto Five. Good grief. Are you kidding me? The, number three? Number three. Number three. <laughs> it's Grand Theft Auto Five, which is which is unreal. Uh, I mean, this game must it had to have sold like 80 million copies at this point. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. It, it was uh, on sale a couple times for thirty bucks throughout the month. It's it's always on sale. I mean, I see it for thirty dollars almost every single week, uh, either on a on a digital sale on the PS4 or the Xbox One, or in like a circular, like like Best Buy or whatever. It's it's always on sale, and I'm sure that contributes to to its continued success. But the fact that there are still enough people that don't own this game that want this game for this to land at number three is staggering. I mean, this this game's been out for like four years now, and people are still buying it in in just massive numbers like this. It's it's uncanny. Uh, at number four, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. Uh, nice showing for that game with uh, you know one day of, of release for the month. Yeah. Um, Arms came in at number five. At Good number job, six, <laughs> nice grenade, Brent. Uh, at number six, <laughs> The Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, still making its mark there. Mario Kart 8, another Switch title at number 7. It's 5, 6, and 7, all Switch titles. At number 8, Overwatch. Number 9, NBA 2K17. And number 10, Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, so, those are your top 10. The bottom 10 are Ghost Recon Wildlands, which that, that's quite the fall from grace for that title, isn't it, Brent? I feel like that was up at like 3 or 4 last month, but maybe I'm mistaken. Um, Call of Duty Black Ops 3. MLB 17, the show, at number 13. Is that game still performing strong? Rainbow Six Siege, still up there. Uh, Infinite Warfare, all the way down at 15. That's that's pretty below pretty Black shocking. Ops below Black Ops 3. Below Black Ops 3. Pretty, pretty shocking for a Call of Duty game, and clearly why they wanted to go back to World War II with this year's game. Battlefield 1's at 16. Minecraft is at 17. The Elder Scrolls Online. Morrowind is at 18. FIFA 17 is at 19. And rounding out the top 20, Forza Horizon 3. None of the uh, Nintendo games on here include digital sales. And, of course, Overwatch does not include Blizzard's Battle.net sales. So, um, Frankie, how about Tekken 2 and Injustice 2? Injustice 2, a game that was at the top of the charts for May when it came out. And here we are in June with another big-time fighting game in Tekken 7 coming out. And Injustice 2 still there at number 2 on the charts. Yeah, um, that's what do you think, awesome man? to see, man. I uh, especially seeing Tekken at number one. I was actually kind of surprised by that because, yeah, like I, I I figured Injustice would do well, but I've never never pictured Tekken as like a huge like as like huge a franchise as like you know Injustice or Street Fighter even. Like I know Tekken's popular, but I didn't think it was still you know like people are going to be flocking out to pick up Tekken Seven on release. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we didn't hear any like sales numbers on the game initially either. So, you know, mm-hmm. we didn't hear like, oh, yeah, this game's doing really great or anything. So to see it at the top of, of the uh, the heap this month was really awesome. Um, did you guys, I don't know if you guys saw this article, but apparently um, Grand Theft Auto V has now outsold Mass Effect Andromeda and Horizon Zero Dawn this year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did see that. That is insane. That is ridiculous. Yeah. It's a lot of uh, a lot of copies of that game <laughs> Get, getting sold getting sold to people. It's 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 pretty unreal. Um, Brent, what do you think when you see Tekken 7 and Justice 2 at the top of the list, man? And ARMS at, at number 5. <laughs> I just assume that just 
there was nothing at all. <laughs> which <laughs> are, so which of those three is your favorite? Because I'm I just assume you bought Tekken and Justice as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't have uh, I don't have either of those games. No, that's that's awesome that that they're both up there though. I mean, they they both re- all reviewed very well. They're all exceptional fighting games, but um, no, I just couldn't care less. This is a this is a testament to what they've done with Tekken Seven and with Injustice Two. Injustice Two has reached a group of people that fighting games typically don't reach. This is a this is a mainstream game. Like people love this game, even if they don't typically play fighting games. They get in there, they really get into the story mode, like the multiverse mode. Like people are are addicted to that, and they really get into it. So even if they're not a professional level fighting game player, a professional level Nether Realm games player. They can still get into Injustice to enjoy the story with all of these classic superhero characters that everybody knows. And, you know, Ed Boon and Netherrealm, they've just been able to capture something with Injustice 2 where they've been able to bring in this more casual fighting game crowd alongside the diehards that are going to buy it and play it because they really get into fighting games as well. So shout out to Ed over there for making that happen. Same thing with Tekken 7. I mean, for Tekken 7 to come out the seventh iteration in this franchise, to come out, and still be this popular among the fighting crowd and still appeal to the you know to to other gamers as well that's that's pretty impressive um the uh there was an interview with ed boone i think it was giant bomb they had him on an e3 time but he was talking about how when they were developing injustice 2 like for the story mode especially because that was the the thing that stood out about the first game was people were people were picking it up because they heard the story mode was awesome so mm-hmm. they wanted to carry that in but with, when they were developing it they intentionally wanted to make the like the story stuff playable like the the AI a lot easier on you just mm-hmm. so that people could get in there and the people who wanted to pick up the game and experience the story could do that you know and then you know kind of if they got into the mechanics like go and learn from there but that was like an intentional design thing i thought was pretty cool to hear them doing Definitely. Another uh, another interesting point from this list here is, is Crash. So Crash launched on, on June 30th, which was the last day of June. And not only is it number four on, on the MPD here, but it was actually the number one physical game in the entire world for the month of June. Being on sale for one day. Or, or two days, depending on how on how uh, the things reported for, for the month of June. Some Some reports bled into the 1st of July as well. So in, in two days worth of work, Crash Bandicoot became the top-selling physical piece of software for the entire world for the month of June. So uh, pretty safe to say that the Bandicoot has has uh, you know landed with with people in in a way that I think many of us didn't expect. Um, Bender, anything else stand out to you on this list, man? What do you think about these uh, Nintendo titles still sitting in the pack here? Um, so ARMS, The Legend of Zelda, Mario Kart 8, still chugging along even when the Switch is in very short supply. Um, yeah, I think that's great. I think that shows um, that the Switch is pretty popular and those games are selling well. That's I think that's a, a good thing. Um, yeah, and that Crash Bandicoot thing is, is crazy for it to, to sell that well and with only one day on the market hmm. i think that's pretty impressive yeah I, I really hope activision sees that as a sign to go back and do more collections like that just so these older franchises that have maybe kind of almost been lost the time a little bit mm-hmm. yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> spyro <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the one that everybody's pounding the pavement for now so they saw a crash they saw it it was not only that um that crash was was done and it was brought out but it was the way vicarious visions did it as well with the care that they put into this title the way that they put this package together was really really well done and people want to see that for spyro now as well so if activision can do that maybe even vicarious vision steps in and and does that but if they can do that for spyro there's going to be a lot of happy people and a lot of a lot of people that are excited about that brent another another interesting thing about this list is, is not only in the top 10 but in the top 20 prey nowhere to be found so a game that debuted in May has completely fallen off the list. Not even in the top 20 games. What do you make of that, dude? Just a continuing trend that we're seeing with some of these Bethesda games, these these first-person games without multiplayer components. They just don't have the staying power that, uh, that they used to. Not even in the top 10 games for the PlayStation 4 or Xbox One as well. So when you break down the top 20 MPD list and you take out the top 10 games for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One individually, Pray nowhere to be found on either of those lists. It's a damn shame. 
What do you think about that, Frankie? I'm with Brent. That's a that's a bit real bummer. Um, I actually I I kind of fell off of prey myself. Uh, I have some kind of issues with some of the design of it, but just mm-hmm. like seeing the care that like Arcane put into making that game, like it's it it just sucks. Like knowing that I don't, I don't know if like you know going forward, you know I don't know if they're gonna start reconsidering some of these, but I just worry that it's gonna hit a point where Bethesda is gonna kind of reconsider putting out something like Wolfenstein, and you're gonna see them kind of wanna have a multiplayer component factored into that game and you know i don't want to see like machine games have to take time off development you know essentially take away from the campaign to put in a multiplayer you know just because bethesda kind of wants something to maybe reach a wider audience um Mm -hmm. and same with evil within you know i I just worry like it's going to hit a point now where these games just aren't performing well enough and bethesda is going to start stepping away from you know making some of these games and that's going to suck yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a real concern. Um, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting, though, when you take a game like Doom, a game like Doom, which has a multiplayer component, and people couldn't give two shits about the multiplayer in Doom. Like, all they care about is the single player. In so much that they made all of this multiplayer DLC for Doom, and now they're just giving it away now. Just because that, that's how much like, people are into the multiplayer for this game. Like, they just don't care. They had to completely revamp the multiplayer, give everybody the DLC for free, and just hope against hope that it catches on with somebody, and and somebody gives gives a damn about the about the Doom multiplayer. But uh, yeah, I mean, are we in danger of of not having um, just these single player first person experiences? I mean, how many more of these can Bethesda make, and just have them just tank? This has to be costing them a lot of money. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the other uh, the other side of this is the hardware. PlayStation Four was the top selling piece of hardware. Uh, quote: This is from uh, one of the guys that is the MPD Piscatella. The PlayStation Four was June's best selling hardware platform, driven by the slim PlayStation Four system in gold with a one terabyte hard drive. So that's interesting. Um, it was the best performing June for PlayStation Four unit sales to date. So in the Basically, in the almost four years that PlayStation's been out, this is the best June that they've had, which is uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, obviously, the the Switch continues to be in short supply. I did see a Switch just sitting on the shelf the other day, though, um, when I was at Target. They did have Switches, so um, they're I've, I've seen they're slowly creeping in. Yeah, they're slowly kind of showing up here and there. So if you're vigilant, you can you can catch a Switch now. Um, quite a few. Quite a few times the past few weeks, I've seen either Best Buy post a bundle or Amazon or GameStop or somebody. Like there's Nintendo's getting switches out to these places, so if you're in need of one, just keep your eyes peeled. It uh, it'll it'll show up sooner rather than later. So that's about the that's about it for the MPD, Brent. Cool, and that's gonna do it for this week's show, uh, gentlemen. Where can we find you gaming and tweeting, Franklin? You can find me on PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, the Nintendo Network, um, your Nintendo Switch app network thing, <laughs> uh, Twitter anywhere at Viper Strike. Bender? I'm on Twitter at Bender underscore guitar. I'm on PlayStation Network and Nintendo Network at me underscore Bender and uh, on Xbox Live at me Bender82. Cool. Boys? As always, Brent, I'll be not tweeting at Piccolo930. That's my PSN ID as well, so you can find me on there at Piccolo930. So I'm right on the Switch as well, so if you need to hit me up on there, let me know. Awesome. Uh, you can find me on the PlayStation Network, the Dude 79 uh, Xbox Live, the Real Dude 79 Nintendo Switch, the Dude 79 and on Twitter, the Dude1979. Make sure you visit the website, www.shortpause.com. Follow us on Twitter, at the Short Pause. If you enjoy this podcast, go over to iTunes. Give us a five-star rating. Those five-star ratings help get us some exposure, get our podcast out there more to more people. So uh, go over there. If you're not quite ready to give us a five-star rating, that's cool. You don't have to. Come over to the website. Go right into the comments. Let us know your thoughts on the podcast. Feedback, criticisms, anything, sound off there. If you want to write something really nasty, that's cool. Podcast at shortpause.com. We check that email every single day. We need to hear from you. It's the only way this podcast will get better. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Short Pause Gaming. Tuesday night, Indie Spotlight will be Pyre. Ben will be taking that game for a spin this week. Check that out. YouTube, Short Pause is Short Pause Gaming. Twitch, Short Pause Gaming. And Mixer, Short Pause Gaming. 
You can find this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Google Play, Stitcher, and right here on YouTube. For Mr. Boyce, Mr. Ayler, and Mr. Holt, I'm Brent Felsing. Thanks again for tuning into the Short Pause Gaming Podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.